persons. Uh, we have Swati Sharma, our executive officer, Greg Forrest, our attorney, Linda Campo, our senior staff engineer, Sheena Brooks, our other board clerk who's joining us online. Um, I would also like to introduce and thank today's support team, DTSC OEIM staff who assist with all technical needs, Arwen Agolto, Isabella Aslan, Jason Raley, all at the back of the, this room. DTSC communication staff, Adam Calvillo Kane. He helps with our audio and visual setup, including the camera angles and our YouTube video editing. California State University Sacramento staff who assists as our Zoom facilitator and registration, Gabriela Cinquini and Sue Woods out in the hallway uh, helping with registration. From Cal Interpreting and Translations, we are joined by two Spanish interpreters, Janet Hernandez and Fabiola Valencia. From Cal Recycles AV Services, who are currently live streaming today's hearing, Josh Levesky, Abe Myers, and Joaquin Marietta. Uh, today's meeting is being live streamed and recorded, so by your continued participation is acknowledgement that you are being recorded. Again, today is November 30th at 9.21, and the meeting is now called to order. Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Um, Evelyn, will you call the roll for a quorum, please? Yes, thank you. Jeannie Riz Rizzo? Present. Sushma Bhatia? Here. Georgette Gomez? Here. That was a here. Uh, Alexa Strauss-Hacker? Here. Lizette Ruiz? Here. All members are present and a quorum is established. I will now review some logistical items. Um, we are conducting today's meeting in person and offering remote options by phone and Zoom. For those of you joining us on Zoom, I would like to instruct everyone to select their preferred language option so that you will be able to fully participate. To do so, uh, everyone's needs, everyone needs to select the interpretation icon on your Zoom toolbar, which is located at the bottom of your screen. Here you will see three options. Select, please select your language preference, either English or Spanish. If you like, select Spanish, you will be placed in the Spanish interpretation room. Please note, if you do not see the interpretation icon, you may need to update your Zoom application. For participants who have joined us in person, and would prefer to participate in Spanish. We have headsets uh, located uh, outside on our registration table. Um, one of our staff persons will assist you. For those of you in the room due to the building's low internet bandwidth, we ask that you not connect to the community center's Wi-Fi. Please either use your mobile data or mobile hotspot. Additionally, if you will be following along on Zoom, please ensure that both your speaker and microphone devices are muted. If anyone experiences connectivity issues with Zoom, you can call in uh, for either English or Spanish. The phone numbers are provided to you now on the slide, and they will also be provided in the chat, also on our website. And we will now hear from one of our interpreters to provide these instructions for us in Spanish. Ahora vamos a revisar algunos artículos de logística para esta reunión y estamos conduciendo este taller en persona hoy. También estamos ofreciendo opciones alternativas de participación al público a través, eh, remotamente a través del teléfono y vía Zoom. Uh, si usted está a través de la plataforma Zoom, le vamos a instruir a cada uno que por favor seleccione su lenguaje de preferencia. Puede eh, hacerlo en la opción que estará disponible eh, para participar en esta reunión. Si alguno necesita seleccionar la la interpretación en el, equal, en el icono del Zoom en la barra de abajo de su pantalla que está localizada. Por favor, vea las tres opciones. Seleccione su lenguaje de preferencia, ya sea inglés o español. Si selecciona español, usted estará puesto en español, en, la, en el cuarto de interpretación de español. Por favor, uh, note que si la interpretación, el icono de interpretación que usted tiene está a actualizado, tiene que actualizar su aplicación de Zoom. Para los participantes que están uh, unidos en esta, esta, este taller en persona, les referimos que pueden participar escuchando este taller en español. Tenemos um, eh, localizados en una mesa, eh, una estación para los intérpretes. Tenemos también audífonos eh, en la parte de atrás. Por favor, eh, 
hacer que sea la estación y una persona le asistirá. Y para aquellos que están en, esta, en este auditorio, tenemos, uh, de, queremos dejarles saber que debido al ancho de banda de la internet, le pedimos por favor que use sus datos de teléfono personal, ya sea la parte móvil o el hotspot. Adicionalmente, a los que están en la plataforma de Zoom, por favor asegúrese que tenga los dos, el micrófono y su parlante en modo silencio. Uh, también le vamos a proveer eh, a los que están a través del teléfono, el número eh, de teléfono de acceso lo estamos poniendo aquí en la pantalla y también lo vamos a poner en la cajita de chat. Por favor, también vea que lo tenemos puesto en la página web. Muchas gracias. Back to you. Thank you. Next slide, please. And so I will now move along to uh, some housekeeping items. Um, please look around now and identify two exits closest to you uh, in case uh, of an evacuation. Um, in some cases, an exit may be behind you in the event of a fire, al fire alarm. We are required to evacuate this room. As a reminder, please take your valuables with you. The drinking fountain and restrooms are located directly across the hallway and to the left outside of this room. The board will take a 10 minute break around 10, 10 a.m. Um, and then following a one hour lunch break at approximately 11.50 a.m. Agenda items may fluctuate. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's an estimated time. Uh, meeting materials are available on the registration table, again, outside this room, um, and they can also be found at our website at bes.dtsc.ca.gov. Closed captions are enabled, and you can move the caption display or turn it off altogether. Um, I also want to point out that for folks in this room, we do have a kitchenette out here, but it is closed to the public. I want to respect uh, the the venue that we are in here today. This board runs on coffee and snacks. So please, um, uh, for the public, it's it, it will not be open to the public. Uh, to protect everyone's virtual space and networks, we will use the Q&A function as our chat fun function to ensure that harmful spam links are not being shared. The Q&A function will be reserved for those attendees that are experiencing technical difficulties or unable to make verbal comments. Please clearly type at the beginning of your comments. Please read aloud and a designated staff person will notify me. To ensure that all board members are fully present and focused on today's presentations and discussions, they are not reading or following along in the chat. All participants will remain on mute until a Zoom host unmutes them when once recognized for comment. The only videos screens shared will be of the board members, board clerk, and presenters. And now we'll go over some instructions on how to participate in public comment throughout today's board meeting. Uh, we are looking forward to hearing from the public throughout this meeting and have scheduled times on the agenda to do so. We welcome the many residents and industry and community organizations that are joining us today in Hacienda Heights. Our public forum, uh, agenda item, item number eight will be held once we return from our lunch break at approximately 12.50. If you have a comment on a specific agenda item, please hold the comment until that agenda item. As you have seen in our recent email notifications, we will use a new public forum sign-up system to create a more orderly process of identifying public commenters in advance. Sign-up is not required, but is strongly recommended to ensure you are added to the commenter list and proper time allocation can be determined. Thank you to those who have signed up in advance. Uh, for those of you who wish to comment during public forum but were not able to sign up prior to the cutoff, please complete a comment card, which is located at the registration table and next to me at my desk. There's these, these little green papers here. Uh, and submit, submit them uh, back to me here or again at the registration table. Uh, the order in which I receive them uh, is the order that you will be called upon for the public the public forum after we have called on the sign up list. Uh, when we open the floor for a public comment, I will alternate who I call on first between the person 
uh, in-person and Zoom participants. There are several different ways in which you can participate. For in-person participants wishing to be recognized for comment, please raise your hand to prevent a line from forming at the podium, and I will call you up individually. For those, those joining us on Zoom, please raise your virtual hand and press star nine on your phone. I will acknowledge each commenter by first and last names as displayed on Zoom, and I apologize in advance if I mispronounce any names. If you have joined our Spanish channel, please wait for the interpreters to provide instructions. We ask that um, when it is your opportunity to comment, you speak at an even pace to ensure all participants can hear you. If you would like to express your comment in writing, you may submit it via email to besinfo at bes.ca.gov. If you are experiencing technical difficulties or are unable to make verbal comments, again, you may use the Q&A chat function. Please clearly state, again, uh, to please read aloud and a designated staff will notify me. To ensure that all members of the public who wish to speak get to do so, we ask that you take no longer than three minutes to make a public comment. If you anticipate that your comment will be longer than three minutes and would like to request a time extension from the board chair, please do so at the start of your comment. For your convenience, we will see a timer located on the screen. You will hear a chime sound when there are 30 seconds left uh, and another melody when the three minutes are up. The time allotted will be doubled for participants expressing their comment in Spanish to allow to allow um, time for translation. Uh, if you're commenting in Spanish, please let us know at the start of your comment. And that concludes the introductory review for today's meeting. I will now hand it over to Chair Rizzo for item number two. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, Welcome back. For those of you who came back after yesterday's marathon hearing, I appreciate you being here. We've got about a dozen people here and 70 people on Zoom. So welcome to all our Zoom participants. I appreciate you uh, tuning in for this Board of Environmental Safety meeting, our regular, um, regular business meeting. Uh, as many of you know, and we'll hear more about later um, in board reports, we held a uh, our first permit appeals hearing yesterday, uh, the permit appeal uh, by Clean Air Coalition of North Whittier and Avocado Heights, um, challenging the ECOBAT and DTSC temporary authorization. Uh, many of you know the outcome of that, um, a, a vote of the board, uh, supported the appeal by Clean Air Coalition, represented again by Earth Justice, and, and we'll talk more about that later. Uh, yesterday, we had about 100 people in the audience and about another 100 people on Zoom. So it was uh, obviously quite a bit of uh, public community interest in uh, yesterday's hearing. And it, it included community members, uh, people who identify with Clean Air Coalition, uh, Teamsters who work at Ecobat, um, electeds, union reps, school teachers, um, school administrators, uh, staff from uh, DTSC and other community groups. So it was a robust day. And for those of you who are looking for Saturday morning TV watching, uh, the hearing, as all of our hearings, uh, will be posted online, and you're more than welcome to tune in and watch that. Uh, we have a, a relatively light agenda today, and uh, we'll be talking about, um, sorry, I think we're all a little tired, to be perfectly honest, but uh, we will have a report following um, my report right now from our executive officer, Swathi Sharma, She'll give an update on hiring, future board meeting dates, fee setting update, uh, action items that, um, that we're following up on from the last meeting. As you know, at the end of each meeting, uh, we identify the action items from that meeting, and then our, our, um, our plan is to report back on our progress on those action items. That'll be followed by hazardous waste permit appeal update, De Ocampo, who you've met, who's our uh, senior staff engineer, uh, Liz Ruiz, 
hand up so people know who you are, and Alexis Hacker, who are the subcommittee on, on the Hazardous Waste Permit Appeal uh, Subcommittee. They will report out on uh, what went on over the last several days and what's upcoming with the Lighting Resources Appeal uh, hearing in January. We'll then have a, a short break, and uh, we're running a little late. We might catch up on time, but we have the Department of Toxic Substance Control Leadership Report, which is a standing item, and as we've mentioned before, Director Meredith Williams, Dr. Williams, attends our meetings and gives the report directly, responding to questions that the board has asked over the course of the time between meetings. And also, as you may remember, those of you who have been uh, tracking us and those who haven't need to know that every year the board approves the director's priorities, which we did last February. Uh, and the director is called upon at board meetings to report out on um, the update. So she'll be giving her annual priorities update today. Uh, also talking about Kettleman, an, an update on Exide. Um, there's a number of items that she'll include in her report, but Exide has become a standing item on, on, uh, on the agenda for the director to report. We'll further have a legislative update. Uh, the um, ledge director for DTSC, will be attending. Now her flight was delayed, so she may not uh, come up in that segment, but you will hear from her. So that's coming a bit later. She'll give that directly. We'll then move into board member reports. What's going on with the EJAC, which is the Environmental Justice Advisory Council. Georgette and Liz will talk with us about that. Alexis Hacker, who's our uh, liaison to the Department of Defense. Uh, then Sushma and Georgette will talk about their tour of PTI, FiberTech. And then and Liz will report on having attended the Ecobat information meeting. So those will all happen. Uh, and then we will go into the really fun part of approving minutes, um, which I know you're all eager to do and you've all read the minutes. And then we'll take a lunch break. And then we'll, uh, after lunch, which is mostly the time that we hold the public forum, which is the opportunity for public to make comments for items not on the agenda. There'll be opportunities at various points in the meeting for public comments about the segments that went before that. That would be the time to respond to those items. If there's something not on the agenda, then the public comment uh, period, the public forum is your opportunity to bring up issues that you want the board and the broader public and DTSC to be aware of. We'll then go into uh, hearing from um, Katie Butler from DTSC talking about the hazardous waste management plan. Uh, as you heard, uh, many of you know and have read, the hazardous waste management report has been issued. That is the first step to the phase of planning. What the goal is by March of 2025 for the board to approve a plan for the department on management of hazardous waste. So for those of you interested in that, and I would imagine you all are from some perspective, uh, whether it's a facility you're interested in, a community, hazardous waste has to go somewhere. Where is it going to go? What's the plan? What's the state's plan? We'll be working on that. There'll be workshops. We'll be discussing it at every board meeting. We'll be providing input. So if you're interested in that, and we hear from a lot of community members that, that you are, whether the hazardous waste facility is in your area or not, uh, where does the waste from where you live go? And if you live somewhere near where it goes, you have an opinion. So we need to hear from you. So please, uh, please read the Hazardous Waste Management Report. It's how many pages? 400 or something? No. I, it's a long report, but it's really, it's really dense and good, and it's the basis for the plan. So it's going to be really challenging to talk about the plan if, if we are not schooled in the report, because the report drives the plan. So um, 
after you watch the hearing on, on TV on Saturday, you can move right into uh, reading your report. Then we'll, we'll be coming to the close of our meeting and we'll review action items, if any, that come up today. And then if there's any closing remarks uh, from members of the board about their experience over the last uh, two days in particular, or items that they wanna bring your attention to, it will happen at that time. So again, thank you all for your interest. And I will now turn it over to our executive officer, Swathi Sharma, to give a report and update. Uh, and for those of you who are not aware, Swathi is our first and most significant, um, our first hire, basically. She's our executive officer and the staff that you see here at the table and remotely, and then over time expanding and growing, uh, all report to Swathi. And so she has a big job because she also has to support us and we're not easy. So, you know, <laughs> there's a lot for her to do. She's navigating five board members. I'm full-time, the rest are half-time. She's got staff scattered all over the state, demands coming all the time. Um, her schedule is something that uh, is not to be admired or sought because it's pretty, uh, it's fraught, as I like to say. So we really appreciate you, Swathi, and are grateful for you. And getting ready for this last two days has been a mega monster effort on her part. And I really want to take an opportunity to thank Swathi because, you know, none of this happens, whether it's arranging for the facility and the translators and the support staff uh, and coming back and saying, they don't have adequate Wi-Fi. What are we going to do? The community wants us to be here. And Swathi figures it out. So she's our go-to person and we admire her tremendously. And now we'll get to hear from her. Thank you, Swathi. Thank you so much for those kind words. And I, I, I can't do it without our team. So Sheena, Evelyn, Greg, Linda, and CSUS, CIT, um, OEIM team. It's it's a group effort. So it's not it's not just me. It's it's an entire group effort. But thank you for those uh, really kind words. I really appreciate it. All right. So um, we will go ahead and get started with um, my report. Next slide, please. So before we get started, I wanted to double check. I know that the Zoom audio has been a little low for participants. So I wanted to check and see with our fabulous technical team to see if we're okay and if I should proceed forward or not, or if it's still a little low. Okay, how about now? Is this better? Yeah? Okay. I will keep my mouth right next to the mic so that everyone can hear me. Okay, so at our last uh, board meeting um, on September 7th, which was held in HQ in Sacramento, um, we had several action items, and we're going to make this a practice that in every um, EO report that I do at a board meeting, we're going to look back at the action items that the board committed to and provide an update on where the board is at with those action items. So in terms of fee settings, we had a request from board member Ruiz to have a report on our hazardous waste generation and handling fee setting at every board meeting. So as many of you may or may not know, the board is tasked with um, setting the fees annually when it comes to hazardous waste generation and handling fees. This is a year long effort, which is um, led by board member Sushma Bhatia and chair Jeannie Rizzo, as well as our staff, um, Greg and Linda and myself, and just understanding the nuances when it comes to fee setting. So we have meetings every two weeks with DTSC's financial team to understand all of the details that go into this so that the board can be prepared for the next year to set fees. So our next meeting um, in January, we will have an update from DTSC on staffing and revenue and where we are at um, when it comes to our engagement with DTSC when it comes to fees. We have received several requests to engage with the public earlier when it comes to fee settings. 
This last year, we started the process earlier on, but when it came to public engagement, we did that throughout the summer. And we understand that it's a very tight timeline when it comes to understanding fees and then the board making the decision on voting um, for those fees, which are usually set at the September board meeting, they're adopted in October. So we've heard that request from stakeholders and we are going to hold public workshops earlier on in the year so that the public can understand fees along with the board as we're making these decisions. So we will hold those early in 2024 uh, along with DTSC. During that time, BES will be exploring penalty structure, exemptions, and also establish um, a more thorough timeline. Um, and then changing the, the adopting and voting on the fees will still happen during the same time every year. That will generally always happen in September and be adopted in October. I'll pause there to see if any board members have any questions or especially member Ruiz since this request came around along the fee setting. No. no. Okay, great. Also at our last board meeting, we had a robust discussion about Santa Susana Field Lab. We had presentations from DTSC as well as Parents Against Santa Susana, and the board learned a lot about um, all the details that go into Santa Susana. It's a quite a big undertaking. The board had committed to creating a working group and I wanted to report back that um, member Liz Ruiz will be leading that effort when it comes to engaging and learning about Santa Susana Field Lab. So we look forward along with um, support staff that will also be learning and engaging along the way. And we will, we have been and will be setting up meetings with DTSC as well as the community to learn more about this very important issue. Next at our last board meeting, we, oh, sorry, you can stay on the slide. Um, we had a request from the public from Janet Johnson from Richmond Shoreline Alliance, um, who had expressed concern about the Crescent Park community, which is near Zeneca site and how to obtain Prop 65 related information. So Prop 65 information, um, our sister agency, OEHA, handles that and there was a request for board member Batia to follow up with OEHA and my understanding is um, board member Batia has followed up with OEHA. We're still waiting on setting up those meetings so that board member Batia can uncover and have a answer for Janet Johnson. Next, we also had a discussion about Hunter's Point Naval Shipyard and the five-year review that's coming out next year. Um, BES had committed that staff will check in with DTSC early on in 2024 and report back on what our findings are. So in our early board meetings in 2024, we will have um, a report back of what the engagement looks like when it comes to Hunter's Point Naval Shipyard. Lastly, um, board member uh, Sushma Bhatia and Chair Rizzo have reviewed the Ombuds database. Um, DTSC OEIM team has been working uh, many months on creating this new database so that the public can engage um, easier with not only BES, but with DTSC when it comes to inquiries and questions that the public might have. We are very close to launching that database. Um, I know that OEIM has taken in the different changes and requests that both of the board members had. And I'm hoping that within the next four weeks, we should be able to launch that website publicly. Next slide, please. In terms of hiring, um, we are in the process right now um, of conducting interviews and hiring our EPM1 as well as our SSM1. And we will have an upcoming posting for senior environmental scientists. So if you are interested in joining our wonderful and growing team, please look out for the senior environmental scientist posting. Can you describe what those acronyms are for people who are not in Oh, sure. So EPM1 is Environmental Program Manager 1, and SSM1 is, I'm blinking on this, Senior Staff Manager. Yes, thank you, Greg. And then Senior Environmental Scientist. Lastly, we have had some changes um, to our board meeting dates. 
Um, what we had previously announced, some of those dates have shifted. Next slide, please. So these are our upcoming board meeting dates. As you can see, majority of them have two dates, and that's really so that we can account for if there's another permit appeal or if there's a workshop such as fee setting workshop or hazardous waste management plan um, workshop. So we've done this two days so that we can have a board meeting one day and either a hearing or a workshop on the other day. So please mark your calendars. This is all on our website as well. Um, nearly half of those meetings will be throughout the state of California and the other half will be in Sacramento and we will always be available on Zoom as well. Yes. If we could go back to that slide for a moment, um, I just wanted to note that our January 16th and 17th meetings will be in Ontario um, in conjunction with hearing the Lighting Resources Permit Appeal. Our January 20th, excuse me, our March 20th and 21st meetings will be at the Cal EPA building in Sacramento. And given um, our executive officer's update about fees, um, we are planning that the July 11th meeting would focus on um, the prep for what the next round of fees would be for the rulemaking, as Swathi announced, that would follow in the September-October timeframe. So I just wanted to add those, those details for those that may have a, a particular interest in those. Thank you. And that is all. Thank you, Swathi. Uh, there will be an opportunity for public comments on what you've heard um, after we hear from Linda Ocampo with um, a hazardous waste. Yes. Yeah, and the subcommittee, right. Well, I was yeah. following that. Um, we'll start with, I don't know where we're starting. You can, you can start with the I mean, Master Hey, Gabriela, can we put the master deck? Oh. Mm. See, we'll provide an update on the hazardous waste permit appeals um, since our last meeting. Um, we've conducted the EcoBat appeal on the temporary authorization, and board member Strauss Packer has some comments on that. Next, please. Member Ruiz. Get a mic. Comments on the talk about the outcome, oh. the hearing. Thank you. Uh, yes. Yeah, so we had our first uh, hearing last night, <laughs> and ended <laughs> up pretty pretty late. But um, we did. Um, sorry, we did. Uh, receive um, presentations from the uh, appellant, Earth Justice, who is representing um, a Clean Air Coalition of Avocado Heights. Um, and we also received presentations from um, the, um, from EcoBat um, and DTSC who defended their um, temporary authorization. And um, the outcome was that we, um, my colleague um, Sushma Bhatia recommended uh, that we upheld the appeal and the vote was four to one to, um, to the favor of earth justice and the community. I wanted to thank those of you in the room who sat through our lengthy hearing yesterday and note that as our chair had opened with, this was the board's very first um, public uh, permit appeal hearing, the first time that hazardous waste permit appeals were being heard in a public setting. And I wanted to commend all of the participants for not only um, their stamina through a, a long day that um, went a little bit longer than we had envisioned, but just the decorum that was observed, that people came well prepared and were very constructive and respectful of, of one another. 
it was um, really good to feel that we had um, community engagement around issues that were important in the various neighborhoods and interests surrounding this particular facility. And so on behalf of the board, we thank all of the parties, DTSC and ECOBAT and the Clean Air Coalition for being so well prepared for this matter. It was a very narrow singular issue that we were looking at, the temporary authorization, and it was perhaps best for us to start our first public permit appeal hearing with a singular issue. By the time, um, as we'll describe in a moment, we go to our next permit appeal hearing, there will be um, almost 19 issues that are being appealed. So um, it will be a, a different um, approach than the singular issue we dealt with yesterday. So I just wanted to thank everyone, um, our staff, our support staff, and all of the participants for um, helping us get through something we all had a fair amount of nervous energy around um, in terms of being able to do this and do this right and to bring forward the chair's longstanding goals of transparency and accountability. So I think we can um, turn to Linda for the lighting resources update. Sure. Thank you, board member. I'll provide an update on the lighting resources operating permit appeal. Um, I'll first go over a bit of a recap of all the activities that have been completed um, to date. Um, so DTC approved the standard permit on June 30th of 2022. Light and Resources filed the appeal on July 28th of the same year. Um, around the time again, that's when the uh, board undertook the rulemaking for the appeal regulations, uh, which took effect on May 1st. Um, Light and Resources refiled the appeal on May 1st on the same day. Um, initial order was adopted on June 15th, 2023. <laughs> and the briefing period began on July 31st and went through September 15th. So those are just a recap of all the activities that have been completed. Recently, um, we received a continuance of hearing on September 12th from Light and Resources. The board granted the motion on September 22nd, and now the new hearing date is set for January 17th of 2024. Next slide, please. Yep. So we received a motion for continuance on the hearing on September 12th uh, from Light and Resources. The board granted the motion on September 22nd. And now the new hearing date is set for January 17th of 2024 at the same location as previously on Ontario City Hall Chambers. Um, you can get more information on our website, next meeting webpage um, it's listed there. I don't know if someone can drop the link in the chat. Thank you. And that covers the review for the Light and Resources Appeal. Thank you. And for information for those who are not familiar, talk about that initial order, what that we reviewed the request and adopted some number of the total number of appeals. Do you want to walk people through that so they understand? This sure. was not a singular issue. It wasn't like the ECOBAT, which was one temporary authorization. There were multiple items that were being appealed by lighting resources about the permit that they were issued. So it's right. a, a little yeah. different, it's not an outside or community group, it's it's the business itself. Correct, yes. So this was a self-appeal by the facility. Um, the petition originally covered 31 issues. Of the 31 issues, 14 were denied and 17 were granted. Um, the initial order covers what those issues were and were grouped and uh, three different categories. Um, those are the issues that will be reviewed in the final order or at the hearing. Thank you for that. And I, um, we're about to go into public discussion about the items that you just have already heard about. And we, I'm going to ask Greg in particular to be attentive because we can't discuss the merits of that appeal outside of the hearing. So I know if Lighting Resources is present here today, just to know the board uh, can't engage um, until we 
have all the briefs and we're at the meeting in January. If there are other items that people want to discuss, we're more than welcome to, and, and happy to do that. But, you know, to keep the sanctity of the process intact, we don't want to have anything that, um, we didn't talk to Echobat and DTSC about that permit appeal for all the months that went by um, as we were preparing. We rely on the administrative record. I think you heard that yesterday. Those of you who are here, the documents provided by each party. And that's what we review in advance. And then we have testimony um, from the party. So I just feel it's important to say that knowing that the audience includes um, people who have a vested interest in that appeal. So thank you for that. I want Greg can be attentive to it and maybe explain it better. The only thing that I think that's actually a great explanation, uh, Chair Rizzo. The only thing I would add there, just for members of the public, um, when we consider a permit appeal, there are due process rights that attach to that for the participants. And along with that is a limitation on what we call ex parte communications. And so we are restricted in what we can consider to the information presented in the administrative record and testimony that we receive at a hearing. And so we would ask that those community members that have concerns about that particular facility to just hang on and wait until we have that permit appeal hearing because we really are trying to limit the extent to which the board members have those ex parte communications so that we can save them for the hearing, let the benefit, have everybody have the benefit of hearing those together um, just to help our process. Thank you, Greg. Okay, so now uh, we'll welcome public comment. I'll turn it over to you, Evelyn, to see if uh, it, people in the room wanna come up to the mic, if you've got something to say for an item not on the agenda. Could be yesterday's agenda, could be you know some other time if you wanna speak. So right now we'll open the floor for public comment for agenda items number three. The okay. executive, well, so before we three, open the floor, we're gonna go back to uh, ask for board discussion, correct? Okay. Fine. What? Is asking board discussion first? Yeah. Sure, board discussion first. I'm out of order here, uh, but I'm back in order now. Okay, that's fine. Board discussion. Y'all tired? You think it went too long and too late last night? <laughs> Somebody say something, board. Come on. <clears throat> Alexis, you always come up with something. <laughs> I got something. Yeah, go, oh, go ahead. <laughs> uh, I just wanted, not a discussion, but I just wanted to take a moment and really um, thank our team in particular, Linda, uh, has spent hours and hours poring over all of these permit appeal documents. This is the first time the board has gone through this process with Ecobat and then coming up with lighting resources. So we're learning and we're building as we're going through this process. And Linda has done, as well as Greg, really pour through these documents and have the board really become educated and experts on these items so that they can then ask detailed questions and make an educated decision. So I just really wanted to take a moment and thank you both. I know it's been a lot of hours and you spent a lot of time on this. So really, really thank you. If I could add to that. Um... Yeah, it, it, the the amount of effort and, and just presentation of documents and, and was really incredible. Um, it was really easy for us to really look through the administrative record um, and, and um, our staff were always available for us to, you know, ans help answer any questions and, and guide us through through a lot of the complicated um, documents. So I'm, I'm also very grateful and I'm very impressed. And to add to that point, Liz, uh, many of you already know that we are subject to Bagley Keene rules, which means the only time all five of us can talk to each other is at an open meeting. So that means any briefings that we get are done what we call two to one, two board members at a time. We can't have a quorum together at any discussion. 
so that means that every time Linda and Greg were briefing, they had to do it three times um, on the same subject matter to different groups and then not cross-talk those. So it, it's quite an onerous, important, it's all about sunshine, it's all about openness and transparency, but we were not together discussing this until the board meeting yesterday. So it's the first time we had the opportunity to be in each other's company and hear from each other, unless we were in one of the two two ones. So I think that's important to note for those who <clears throat> are tracking why it takes so much and so much time to do things. We're honoring our obligation to Bagley Keene. And whoever Bagley and Keene are, I hope they're applauding. Um, so thank you for that. Okay, sorry. I'm a little punchy. Okay, um, we'll move on to public comment from anyone in the room, right? Thank you. Oh, yes, thank you, mind. Madam Chair. I will now open the floor for public comment for agenda items number three, the executive officer report, and number four, the hazardous permit appeal update. Uh, so, uh, repetition of instructions. For those joining us in person and wish to comment, uh, please raise your hand and I will call you up individually. For jo uh, those joining us on Zoom, please raise your virtual hand um, or press star nine on your phone. If you have joined the Spanish channel by phone, please wait for the interpreters to provide instructions. If you're experiencing technical difficulties or are unable to make verbal comments, you may use the Q&A chat function. Please clearly type at the beginning of your comment. Please read it aloud. Participants have three minutes. Uh, if you anticipate that you will take longer that, than that, you may request a time extension from the board chair, but please do so at the beginning of your comment. For your convenience, you will see a timer located at, at the top of the screen. You will hear a chime sound when the, there are 30 seconds remaining, and then another melody when your three minutes are up. The time allotted will be doubled for participants expressing their comment in Spanish to allow time for translation. If you're commenting in Spanish, please let us know at the start of your comment and we will pull up a translator. Okay, uh, first public comment is at the podium. Uh, first participant, excuse me, please state your name and your affiliation. You have three minutes. We're turning on the mic now. Thank you. You have three minutes. Please state your name and your affiliation. Thank you. My name is Andrea Gordon, and I'm a member of the Clean Air Coalition. Yesterday was the first hearing, as you described. And I want to say how pleased I was, not just because you ruled in favor of Clean Air's appeal, but because it's the first time in years and years and years that we ever felt heard by anyone affiliated with DTSC. It always seemed to us like DTSC was making um, decisions that were uh, designed to keep Quimetco in business and we experienced the ongoing pollution in our area with no seemingly remedy available to us until this board was formed and it seemed like while complying with all the rules and regulations and the laws about how these businesses operate and how they're regulated, in the past there hadn't been any common sense view from that of the public. And we saw that yesterday. It was a long meeting. Uh, uh, so, I, so I know how you must feel today because I'm feeling it myself, I'm tired. <laughs> But I appreciate everything that you did and the time that you took, the study that was required before the meeting so that you would be prepared, and then hearing what everybody said and taking that into consideration. We appreciate it a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming yesterday, today, and your comment. I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Before we go on to Zoom, is there any other uh, hand in person that wants to provide public comment? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on to the hands on Zoom. I see two, the first person. <laughs> okay, that was mine. That. Sorry, you cannot continue. Uh, Zoom participants, first person I see is Eric Nolan. 
please accept the request to unmute from one of my colleagues. You have three minutes. Please state your name and affiliation. Yes, let me make sure first that you can hear me okay. Am I unmuted? You're a little low. Um, okay. See if I can move closer to my microphone. Can you hear me now? Yes. Great, thank you. Um, thank you for that. Uh, I'm Eric Nolan, a uh, member of the Public Citizen of California and uh, founder of Sustaining uh, Stewarding Design, LLC. Uh, and I just first wanted to congratulate the board on a fantastic meeting last night and a successful meeting. I think for your first time, uh, you should be very proud of yourself. So Chirpers and Rizzo, members of the board, nice job last night. Uh, I was viewing from Texas. So yes, it was a very late night. <laughs> so that was a challenge, but it was uh, it was quite good. Thank you for the work that you did. And I believe it was successful. Now, with that said, uh, my opinion is I believe that the outcome was the proper outcome. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. I, I seem to be getting some indications that you can hear me. Um, so I think that the outcome I'm sorry. Was, can you pause yes. for a second? I, yes. You actually are pretty low. Your volume is low. Um, I think I've got it as high as I can go. How about now? Can you hear me better? Is that better? Yes. Okay. Okay, yes. great. Yeah, Sorry I about that. Your time, so you may resume. Great, thank you. Um, so again, congratulations, board. Um, I would say that I generally believe that the outcome was the correct outcome. I think it was a really challenging process, uh, and there were some very good questions asked, and it was uh, not all that easy to come up with a solution. But again, I think in general, you had the proper solution um, or proper response. Um, I'm glad that the public feels that they were listened to, and I think that that was important as well. Now, I will say that I think that this was a good opportunity for DTSC to experience the oversight that the board now is providing, and I'm hoping that DTSC has learned something from this, um, that uh, that they're going to have to follow proper, really diligent procedures and, and processes to make sure that in the future, uh, temporary uh, permits and 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 full permits are going to be scrutinized. And I think that that's important. Um, I will say as, also as a former EHS uh, director for industry and, and manufacturing, I saw a really good solution last night. I thought that the solution that was proposed and, and the presenta presentation by DTSC on the equipment that was proposed seemed like a really good solution in a way to correct a problem uh, that the uh, facility was dealing with. Um, and so I am concerned that that process was cannot be used now and that uh, the current situation at that facility is still in existence. And that that to me is a problem for the environment and for the public and for the workers. So I'm hoping that in the future, uh, DTSC and the board will work together to come up with a way that the that these permitting, uh, particularly these temporary permitting processes, uh, can be done in a way that will avoid the kinds of appeals that occur. There will be much more engagement with the public, that there will be a much uh, more robust process in place, and that DTSC will be able to approve these kinds of things in cases where it's necessary to correct problems in a very short uh, manner. So, uh, again, I, I want to congratulate you. Thank you for the time, and I'll yield back any time that I have. Thank you. I'm sorry that our, my microphone was off, but that was time. Thank you. So I'm having a little trouble with my laptop. Can um, someone call up the next Zoom participant? I don't have- Can a you hear me? Yes, Shana, we can hear you. Shani Nack, you may go ahead. I'm going to send you a request to unmute. Please state your name and affiliation. Hi, I'm Jenny Nack. I'm with Parents Against the Santa Susana Field Lab. Um, I'll keep it super short. I know you guys are exhausted. Um, Parents Against the Santa Susana Field Lab and our community surrounding, the multiple communities surrounding the field lab would like to thank you um, sincerely for following up on your commitment to create the work group. And we look forward to engaging in every way that we can. Um, it's a, I'm speaking from a position of sincere gratitude. We work really hard to show up and build relationships. And we appreciate you recognizing that 
Um, I can't thank you enough. And the only other thing I want to say is a follow-up question or a repeat of a question that I asked at the September meeting regarding um, fees, financials. I know you just mentioned that you're having bi-monthly or bi-weekly meetings um, with the finance department. And I guess I would like to repose a question that I posed in September, which is um, getting an idea of the revenue lost due to failure to implement implement fines and penalties for permit holders. Um, I know in September, there was a discussion of you know how to make DTSC whole financially. And I would love to hear what those numbers look like. Numbers that they could have of um, fees revenue that they could have collected by implementing penalties and fines for permit holders. Thank you so much. Thank you for that. Are there any additional Zoom participants that wish to comment on agenda items three and four? Seeing none, um, Spanish interpreters, can you please let me know if there are any comments on the Spanish line? There are no further comments, Madam Chair. Um, we'll go ahead and close out this public comment period. Your comments, and uh, I know that that one, one item we have requested and we will hear from the finance department at a future meeting on the on to answer the SSFL question about fees and penalties. So that is forthcoming. It, it, we're in the process of an analysis of how, how fees come in, where the exemptions are, what happens with penalties. So we're, we haven't lost track of that, but thank you for bringing it up again. It's definitely in the queue. So thank you for that. Do we need a break or no? Okay. Um, we're, we won't take the break now since we got started a little bit late. And if, doc, if Dr. Williams is ready for us, I want to welcome her to the podium. Um, Dr. Meredith Williams, the director of the Department of Toxic Substances Control. Um, welcome back. Good morning, can you hear me? Yes, okay. Well, thank you for the time as always, I appreciate it. Good morning, Chair Rizzo and board members. Congratulations, I wanna also echo my echo the comments you've heard, congratulating you on your first permit appeal. It marks a milestone. This was um, one of the, as far as I'm concerned, having gone through the reform process, it was one of the two most important mandates for this board was to navigate the appeals. And I do wanna take a minute to uh, salute my staff who I thought acquitted themselves fabulously, um, explained what our thinking was behind granting the temporary authorization, what we thought our authority was. And I thought it was a productive conversation around and I, I was extremely um, pleased with both Leah and, and Wayne. So I will take a moment to, to brag on my staff. Um, this morning, I will talk about three different areas. I'll touch on Exide and where what's what are the recent developments on Exide and what's been happening there. I will go through the priorities and just pick out a few things to bring to your attention. And then I'll wrap up by making a few comments on our Safer Consumer Products Program. So um, next slide, please. Oh, I have the, oh, I have the power. <laughs> okay, with that. Um, so... Give me one second. Great. So as you well know, we've been re-envisioning, recreating a new residential contract for Exide. And I want to, again, thank the board for the support, the work that was done to go through the solicitation process. And now, as hard as that was, the real work is getting that the contract in place, getting the contractor stood up and doing that in a way that's consistent with our commitment to making sure that the issues that have been raised throughout the year are addressed and that the community concerns 
are incorporated into how this residential contract is implemented as we move forward. And to that end, we've been working on the Parsons Transportation residential contract on a number of different fronts. Uh, first and foremost, there is a health and safety plan that the contractor is required to, provide, to develop and which will govern the health and safety for the workers on that on the project. That we have received a draft of that health and safety plan and um, are in the process of reviewing that and we're doing parallel review with community members. One thing I wanna highlight about the new health and safety plan is it's being developed consistent with the new proposed, it's not finalized, the proposed Cal OSHA lead standard. And I, in case you haven't been tracking that issue carefully, I wanna just highlight how, how much more protective that lead standard is. And it is undergoing rulemaking, DTSC has, submitted a letter of support for the rulemaking, um, and we're tracking that very closely. But we're talking about um, lowering the amount of exposure that's acceptable for workers who work with lead. So for instance, the current permissible, um, um, permissible exposure level for an eight hour time period, right now it's 50 micrograms per cubic meter. And that's slated to go down to 10 micrograms per cubic meter. That's a reduction of a factor of five. And the, the action level that would trigger certain protection, protective measures, which is now at 30 micrograms per cubic meter over an eight hour time weighted average, will go down to two. So from 30 to two. So it's a much more protective standard. And that, that will change some procedures in terms of how the workers on the, on the project um, are, how just how their work is managed, how they do the work. So I wanted to draw that to your attention because it's tremendously important. And um, obviously the worker safety concerns have been front and center throughout the year. And um, we think this is a great step in the direction to ensure that they're further protected. There are a number of other elements in the health and safety plan that, um, that we think will, again, make the plan more robust than we've had in the past even. There's also an operational plan, and that's what governs things with just the details of how the cleanup gets done, how the stepwise approach to the excavation, when the sampling is taken, how the reports are generated, um, and it's very detailed. And again, we're reviewing it as a department. The Exide Technology Advisory Group is, is reviewing that. And it provides us with an opportunity, again, to address many of the issues that you raised and that the public has raised and which were, we, we alluded to this when we provided you with responses earlier this year to a number of questions. And, and now is the time to get all of that in place so that the, the cleanup can be done consistent with the issues that have been raised. We are putting in place a third party oversight contract. Dr. James Wells, who's the technical consultant for the, um, for the Exide Technologies Advisory Group, the ETAG, will receive this contract and he will have a broad range of responsibilities. And that includes things like overseeing any post, um, post cleanup sampling to ensure that the, the results are as expected and we've met our cleanup goals to um, being someone to monitor our responsiveness to community concerns, to checking um, on an ongoing basis with worker, worker concerns that might come up. So it's quite a range of responsibilities. So we are working on that statement of, uh, statement of work and our scope of work and working to get that contract in, in place so that when the residential cleanup restarts, that will be in place and, and uh, hopefully the community and workers will have another degree of confidence about how the, the residential cleanup is going forward. Lastly, we're putting in place an incompatible conduct toward others policy or ICTO as you know, we wouldn't be us if we didn't have an acronym. So um, the incompatible contact toward others policy will be something that will be um, provided to workers and will set expectations for how, for how workers interact with each other, what their job responsibilities are. This comes out of what we've learned about some of the worker complaints that have come up. It is 
you know, we've referred a number of issues to the attorney general's office. The attorney, attorney general hasn't necessarily had findings around the issues that have been raised, but the attorney general has a very specific standard by which they're making their determinations. That doesn't mean that um, even though it may meet, uh, may not meet the, the bar that would be necessary for litigation or, you know, other legal um, requirements, there are, there's room, there's room here to put some policies in place that allow the contractor and allow DTSC to make sure that workers are behaving in the way that we expect them to on the cleanup. So those are some of the things that are actually more than that that are ongoing um, with the uh, with the Exide residential contract. There will be an Exide Technologies Advisory Group, the ETAG group workshop on the 14th. It will be very interactive. And the, the goal of that is to see whether or not this health and safety plan and the operations plan meet the needs of the community and are responsive to the issues we've heard. So. That's what's going on on that front. On the parkways, we are in the home stretch on one of the two contracts for initiating cleanup on the parkways. So we do expect the Southern uh, Preliminary Investigation Area contract to be in place by the end of the year. And then it'll take about a month to stand up that and mobilize for that cleanup. And the Northern PIA contract will follow closely on that. So um, I, just to pivot a little bit, we're also resurrecting the workforce and environmental restoration, workforce for environmental restoration and communities program, the work program, that training. And we're doing a few things differently. That training was conducted by LA Trade Tech in the past. And this time around and moving forward, um, Local 300 will manage that training. And what that allows us to do is make sure that there's seamless um, compatibility between the training that other union members go through and what these union members go through. So for instance, there's a boot camp that all local 300 members go through. It is very demanding. It is physically demanding. And what that means is that people who go through it know what's expected in terms of that either that hundred pound load on a wheelbarrow or working in the heat or whatever else. And so um, they'll, trainees will go through that work, through that boot camp, and then they'll get their certifications, their HAZWOPER, their lead worker certification, and all of that will be done at, LA, at local 300 facilities. They've been in very close um, partnership with us. And, you know, the, the, there's what's happening now is we're receiving names of people who are interested. We have a number of different types of workers, whether that's workers who are resident within the PIA, workers who are within a 10 mile radius, workers who are considered transitional. So we're screening all of those different classes of workers um, with a heavy emphasis on getting people who live within the PIA into the program. Right now, we're we're somewhere around 60 folks that we're vetting for that. That number will whittle down. They'll whittle down because their address doesn't fall within the PIA or because the boot camp weeds them out or whatever it is. So our goal is to get a cohort of um, 25 um, trained workers who can work on the cleanup moving forward. I will say that by the time they finish all of this training, these workers won't just be capable of working on the Exide cleanup. They'll be able to take on other work. So it will hopefully serve them and provide an opportunity for other opportunities as they move forward. So that's the Exide update and just talking about where we are on our annual priorities. I'm going to go through this quickly, but you can ask questions. Um, we have a goal for the rate of return to compliance under our equity and enforcement prior, um, uh, work. And I'm, I've shown you here the quarter by quarter breakdown of um, what we're, how we've performed on these metrics. So the first one is we wanna make sure that those permitted facilities that are in our most vulnerable communities get back to compliance quickly. It's very important to us. So we've set a high bar for that 90%. 
We met that for the first two quarters. We're very close in Q4. Um, Q3, there was a dip, and I I apologize to you. There's always a dip in in I think it's the beginning of the fiscal year, and I don't know all the reasons why I wanted to be able to speak to that, but I can't. But we, you know, and you see that also with the violations for all the facilities um, in vulnerable communities, not just the permitted facilities. Nevertheless, uh, especially on the latter case, we are very close to our 80%, and over the course of the year, we will meet that goal for those. Um, on our racial equity, uh, environmental justice objective, we also have a commitment to release and start to implement our racial equity framework for the department. And as a reminder, that's pretty internal facing, things like contracting, training, staffing. And as part of that, we've we've conducted um, a number of listening tours. And what that entailed was executives, our deputy teams, hosting various meetings in total 14 listening sessions to really talk to staff about what is their experience with DEIB within the department, um, what, are their, what challenges are they seeing, what opportunities are they seeing. And we worked hard to give folks the space to really have breakout rooms, dig into these issues. It's it's hard to create a safe space for these conversations, but I do believe that this was a, a step in that direction. Um, there are uh, about half of the staff participated in these. And I will say that it was voluntary, they didn't have to. So I think that's a good indication of the level of interest within, um, within the department. I will highlight that different Groups within the department have different experiences. I will say our African-American, my African-American colleagues are, are struggling on some fronts and we really need to have some work to do around that. And I'll just call that out quite visibly right now. Um, and then we're taking these listening tour findings and integrating that into an organizational assessment where we prioritize what actions we'll be taking as a result of the work we've been doing, surveys, listening sessions, et cetera. So that organizational assessment is going to be conducted this month, or not this month yet, but in December um, with the executive team, all the deputies, as well as our recently um, seated DEIB Advisory Council, of which I believe Greg Forrest is a member. Are you on it? Yeah, thank you for, for stepping up to that. So um, we will continue to keep you posted on our progress on that. And then we are resurrecting some training on DEIB, racial equity. This is something that Cal EPA had initiated. It started from the GAR initiative. I won't explain what all of that is. It's evolved. And now there are people across the BDOs who are trained to conduct um, to conduct training around racial equity and DTSC's trainers are going to demonstrate their training skills in December for a, a subset of staff with the expectation that 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 will be in good shape and we will be able to roll that out to the rest of the department um, starting in Q1. Uh, public engagement, I want to touch on this. We've talked about the Equitable Communities Revitalization Grant. We, I'm, you're well aware that round two, uh, the applications were open. That that period, application period is closed. We received 48 applications for $90 million. That is fewer applications for about the same amount of money. And so what we're seeing is people seeking larger amounts of money. I will say there were a, a lot of gaps in the applications. And so that said, we're not just gonna throw the baby out with the bathwater. We're gonna make sure that, that applicants have the opportunity to close any gaps, fix any problems with their applications. So we're gonna be engaging with them with the expectation that they will, that you know many of those incomplete, um, incomplete applications can be made complete and then we can be, move on with the, the awards process. Also, we haven't talked much about this, but there is the technical advisory, uh, technical assistance grants program. And I'm very happy to see this, this getting off the ground. 
because communities often, not always, some of them are very technically savvy, um, really get down into the details of the work that we do. But in many cases, it you know these are very highly technical issues and communities need assistance. They need support to understand the technical issues and just to navigate where it is that they can plug into our processes where it is we have comment periods, what's appropriate, how to how to interact with us. And so having the funds to secure a technical expert who can help with those services is, I think, tremendously important. And we will use that funding um, to, pro to provide that funding for folks. Um, and that's that um, we expect those grants to be about between $40,000 and $150,000. And um, the total amount in that pot is $2.5 $2 million. And although we'll open the applications, um, you know, we'll open the applications, it'll be rolling. It'll be rolling until January 15th of 2025. So that gives people lots of time. Um, so as long as we have money, we'll be able to, to um, support them on that. Uh, the, la the next two, the Hazardous Waste Management Report, I'm very excited to see that completed, published, um, delivered um, just this week, and you're going to talk about that later this afternoon, and then you're well aware that the Santa Susana um, uh, pro uh, Program Environmental Impact Report was completed. Our la the uh, I do want to talk about our third objective, sustained performance, and that was really Again, um, the other two that I just mentioned were under that objective, but also we have a commitment to reduce the number of continued permits. And we set a goal for ourselves to public notice all of the permits that were more than five years old. At this stage, we have three permits remaining, Kettleman, Wet Hills Landfill, Button Willow, and Ecobat. As you well know, those are um, the focus of a lot of attention. They're big, complicated facilities. We are making tremendous progress. We may knock another one of those off this year. I'm not sure, but we're getting very close. And at, at any rate, um, we do anticipate making those decisions in the coming months with one exception. The Button Willow permit is the is contingent upon Kern County's completion of their environmental impact report. And it's going to be months before they do that. So there's a lot of uncertainty about when we might get to the Button Willow um, landfill permit decision. As opposed, and then we also had a commitment to reduce the number of permits that were more than two years old to continue for two years to less than 10. Right now, there's a total of seven, including those three that I just mentioned, and the four remaining permits. Um, and the with within the range of two years to five years, we have four permits um, that are still outstanding. So again, we've met our objective to be less than 10, and we'll continue to um, work on that. And then lastly, on, um, on my updates, um, we did update our, our dashboard for um, with the fiscal year quarter data for the first quarter of the fiscal year. I hope you've had a chance to look at that. So those are, that's my update on the priorities. Um, and uh, with that, I'll switch to safer consumer products and say happy birthday. Um, it is the 10-year anniversary of the Safer Consumer Products Program, and it, the program took some time to reflect and see where they are, where they've been, what they've learned on the journey, and they've captured all of that in this report called A Decade of Progress, and I included a few highlights here, and I will confess that this is Meredith being a geek because I latched onto th th some things that others will think were geeky, but for me, I was very excited about and number one, data, 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 data. One of the biggest challenges for this program is getting information. Carl Palmer, his, one of his top five quotes is, information is the coin of the realm. And so finding ways to get information is, is critically important. So not only have they taken advantage as the years have progressed 
of new data science tools, hire people who have excellent data mining skills and the ability to pull in data and, and crunch it and slice it and dice it in, in various ways, in a myriad of ways. That's really accelerating some of their decision-making processes, but they've also leveraged their authority. They did an information call-in on nail salon products and um, a number of, um, uh, of the manufacturers, I think it was 30 manufacturers re responded and it was surprising to us that there were 97 chemicals that were reported that were on our candidate chemicals list. And in total, that was 11% of all the chemicals that the, that the respondents told us were in their products. So that was pretty eye-opening. And we will continue to do work on the nail salon products um, based on those findings. And that report is, is being published. Um, scientific rigor. One of the reasons Safer Consumer Products was established was because the legislature was frustrated. They felt like they were actually in over their heads on some of the scientific issues and not always getting it right. You know, for instance, the, the regrettable substitute dilemma, they're, you know, banning BPA only to find out later that BPS was problematic, those kinds of things. They wanted the department to be able to bring expertise to bear on these decisions about how to tackle toxics in products. And I will say the scientific rigor of this program is outstanding. And this is just one point of evidence, which is that the, the program has authored 14 peer reviewed articles and book chapters, but more than just the number they've authored, it's how these things are being used, how wide the impact is for the, not just the, the peer reviewed articles and the book chapters, but also the technical documents that support the decisions. The, the documents that, you know, that started things with PFAS saying PFAS should be regulated as a class. There are, we now have technical peer reviewed publications around that, but the, the technical document itself has served ex extremely well to, to move and advance that conversation in a way that people expect California to do. So that rigor is outstanding. Bottom line is people want us to be reducing exposures to harmful chemicals and the team went through the exercise to estimate. It's a very hard problem. This is one of the pollution prevention problems is how do you measure what was avoided? But using some estimate, estimation techniques, the, the team estimates that we have um, avoided exposures to 400 to 600 metric tons of um, methylene chloride. And methylene chloride has been responsible for a number of fatalities over the years. It's, an, it's a very problematic paint stripper, and now Californians are protected from those exposures. We also estimate having prevented 100 metric tons of perfluorinated chemicals from reaching Californians through the two regulations we've put in place, one for carpets and rugs, and one for the treatment products, for aftermarket treatment products for carpets and rugs. So again, very impactful to protect Californians in the retirement and, and, from, and the environment from these chemicals. And then we continue to inform legislation um, AB 1200, which was about banning um, PFAS in food packaging, relied heavily on the work of this program. So these are just a couple of highlights. I hope you did read the report. We're very excited by the work. And it is a, not only is the 10 year anniversary of Milestone, I do wanna take a moment to talk about another milestone, which is to say that their fearless leader, Carl Palmer, the deputy director for the Safer Consumer Products Program, has decided to retire at the end of the year. And this is <laughs> this is um, a tremendous loss for for the program, for the state. And he's a nationally recognized leader um, in the green chemistry space. His network is incredible, and that's allowed us to tap into other folks and build relationships that are very important to our work and have helped support New York or Minnesota taking on actions. And so it, those will be big shoes to fill. Um, I can't thank Carl enough, 37 years of public service. Amazing, just amazing. Um, and all of that in a package that is um, um, 
the consummate public servant in terms of his dedication and has been, as you well know, I came into the department through the Safer Consumer Products Program. And I also I'll often say, I learned everything I know from Carl because he shepherded me with his wisdom for years. He still does. And I will miss him tremendously as will all of the people in the program. So with that, I'm happy to take your questions. I'm still reacting to Carl. <laughs> um, Carl, if you're listening, Oh my goodness. Well, we wish you well. We'll see you at Biz NGO next week, maybe. Um, I'm not sure he's going. Okay. He's uh, he's he's built his staff to the point there. He doesn't have to show up everywhere. Go, right. And I know it's particularly meaningful for you having come from consumer products. And we share um, that love of the safer consumer products having been involved myself at the front end of the legislation. So it's a program to see it the growth in that yeah. over the years to see how you shepherded that leadership and Carl took it and the additional resources made available in, in this last budget that allowed, uh, which you reported at a previous meeting, um, the additional staffing. It's just amazing. Yeah. And I, it's just a proud moment for all of us to yeah. know that this program, while it isn't under umbrella called P2, it is your P2 program right now, your yeah. pre prevent pollution prevention. If, um, if I may, just one yeah. note on that new, that staff, um, they had a program-wide all, all staff meeting in the in headquarters in Sacramento just last month or the, earlier this month and um it was really great to walk in that room and see so so, so many people just the number of people let alone the fact that you know this is a program that's hired extremely well and has tremendous talent exactly i mean we know some of the new people that have come in and it's it's very impressive so um yes uh i don't know what else to say about that except brava on that and Another Brava on Exide. Um, you know, we we hearken back to those early meetings and community concerns about workers, about about the contractor, and and how you um, you took hold of that and worked. And I'd like to take this opportunity to see if um, Liz and Sushma, who have worked very closely, and Georgette as well on on the EJ piece of it, but on the Exide and the Exide contract, they may have comments or questions for you on that because that that was a role that um, they joined. Mm -hmm. yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Um, yeah, and, and I just really wanted to thank you and, and, and the DTSC's staff who participated at the Exide um, ETAG meetings and, and working group meetings because um, at the at the last ETAG meeting, uh, which Evelyn and I attended, um, we we heard from the community and and they were very thankful for our collaborative work and for 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 the attention that the that Exide's been getting from staff. Um, I I too have noticed um, the increased um, collaboration between the community and DTSC. I, as I mentioned, I participated at the ETAG and, and working group meetings and can see and, and have heard from the participants that, that the responsiveness has increased, that their concerns are taken seriously. Um, you know, our, the outcomes may not be what, what we want as a community, but we are working together. And, and I think that means a lot to the community. I've heard that that means a lot to the community. Um, I do want to take this opportunity to really encourage community members to participate at the next ETAG meeting for the 14th. Uh, we do understand that it's a large ask to ask the community to review these two documents, the hazardous waste, um, I mean, sorry, <laughs> the HASP um, uh, and the operational plan, but we we really want to make sure that um, that everybody's concerns have been met, and you know if there's any outstanding concerns that that we try to work through them, um, especially for those folks who have their properties uh, set to be cleaned up in the near future. I, I have friends and family that that have had them recently, and and they always ask me these questions, and I feel like really knowing where these documents are and and what they include really can really help a lot of our community members. So I'm really glad that 
that we're taking this time um, to really go through these documents to really guide the the community on 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 what they mean and 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 really have that time and, and space to answer their questions. So so again, I really want to invite community members to to the December fourteenth meeting. As I as I was reflecting on all of your comments related to Excite, what's coming up for me is this is what reform looks like. All of those groups, communities, permit holders, staff at DTSC that spearheaded 158, that continue to work on uh, the Excite working group discussions, worked with us on solicitation processes. Thank you for all the time you've put in. Thank you for showing up continually. There are times when things can seem heated uh, and challenging. But there are forums for having a healthy discourse, and that's what it's going to take for reform to land. It's already here. You're seeing examples of it in Excite. It's going to come to all the other issues that we are jointly tackling. Just be patient, show up, uh, and have, help us have a healthy discourse. And thank you. Thank you so much uh, to you, Meredith, personally, to all of the team that's worked on Excite, Todd. Uh, because I've sat through some of those meetings and I know that they have been challenging and I know the tensions have flared and these are really gnarly issues that don't have clear, easy answers. They're operating in a completely gray space. So just a genuine thank you and, a grat and gratitude. Thank you for coming to all of our board meetings this year and bringing the priorities bringing your senior management team, building it, bringing your senior management team. I feel to follow on Sushma's comments that so much has been strengthened in the department's operations and delivery. And we're really grateful to have that face-to-face -face engagement with you before um, the public we serve. As you know, and as folks may know from some of the mandates of the legislation that formed our board, one of our responsibilities is to evaluate the department um, and we are using the director's priorities um, to shape what that evaluation will look like um, as we work toward it with an eye to bringing it to um, completion um, in March. So I, I thank you because over the months, continuing to build on your metrics and having Sushma focus on metrics, it, it just helps us paint a picture as we look at the 2023 year for a, a review. One thing that I have my eye on as we shift from this year to next is the board, one of the board's most difficult tasks is to hear a permit appeal and the possibility, depending on the timing of the permit division, the possibility that an Echobat, a FiberTech and a Button Willow permit will be issued in close proximity to one another. And therefore, within the 30-day deadline for filing an appeal of a final permit decision, the board could be um, extremely challenged with any one of those three, but certainly um, with any combination of those three. And so um, we will stay in close touch with yeah. your team as we plan ahead for what those uh, draft and final permit issue in states maybe. I'm just really concerned that we do good public service in addressing each of those. But yeah. most of all, thank you for being such a steady partner with us through all of this year. Thank you. And thank you. Um, that's a very good reminder and we'll take that back and and think and put, put our permit decisions through that lens. Um, each of the permit decisions will be issued in draft and they'll take different amounts of time to come to completion. Nevertheless, let's not set you guys up for failure. If I can just take one second to return to um, the, the comments you made about Exide. I just felt as though this Tuesday's conversation that we had marked a, a, almost a new level of dialogue. We had community, we had workers, we had union, we had DTSC. 
digging into some tough problems, wrestling with them and looking for solution in a way, again, you know, there's a book that we often reference in the executive team that talks about when you're in a meeting, you got to mine the conflict, figure out where the conflict is, work your way through it. And that was a very needy discussion. And I think it is symbolic of, of really, again, creating that space, the venue for those kinds of conversations, if I may brag. But you know, I'm not just, bragging. I'm bringing, bragging you know, on behalf felt, of everybody who showed up. Well, I, I heard from several people that there was applause at one of those meetings. So I just want to say if people were clapping and applauding, that's like a really good sign. So bravo on that. Um, Georgette? Thank, thank you. And uh, thank you, um, Dr. Williams, for being here and giving this report. I have a, a couple of questions. Uh, related to the report. One is on the um, DI process that y'all went through. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that there were some listening sessions with staff and mm -hmm. that's, that's great. Um, half of the staff participated. Half of the staff didn't participate. Is there like a reason why? And you that's know, great that you, half did. I, I, will, I will just say this, I'm that curious. it is, if you track the literature on DEIB and how to make it effective, it is not always the best. It's not always wise to make things man, you know, mm -hmm. require people yeah. don't engage. They're not sincere. They don't show up. That said, I don't, you know, I, I don't know. I'm not going to interpret why half of the folks didn't. I think what's important for us is making sure it, it's 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 a process to move bring more and more and more staff into the conversation to make you know if those if that half of the pop of the of the organization feels as though it's safer to talk about and we're not there i will tell you that right now mm -hmm. we are not there there are certain pockets that don't feel safe um but we now have visibility on that and we can take some action. So um, it's a process. I, I would encourage you to ask us six months from now. Okay. There are more people in the conversation. But yeah, no, and definitely I think it is and, both and I, the process. I will, I will say I'm hopeful that the new newly seated D, uh, DEI, the Advisory Council, that's those are staff members. They all, They will be able to talk to their counterparts, their colleagues, and maybe give us some insights mm -hmm. as to how we can bring more people into the process. Okay, thank you. Um, and then the other one is Excite. I know that Excite has been a work in progress and it sounds like this last conversation um, was productive and I had the opportunity to participate on, on the interview panel. Uh, which was an interesting process, um, but also a process that I have to acknowledge that um, there was back and forth uh, with with the team and really trying to take um, the content that we were hearing and how to insert it into some sort of productive interviewing process to ensure that we were getting to some of those issues that were being brought up. And I only hope that... Um, my comment to you is on that experience that um, I can only speak for myself um, that I went through and that it that we can take we can step back and learn better ways in which we can utilize that vetting process mm -hmm. to really get to some of the issues like thinking ahead, right? Um, I think this this conversation about access has been going. Um, and there's been frustration and concerns, um, critiques of some of the vendors, but how do we insert that in a productive way, vetting new potential um, companies that are going to do the work? And I felt that the team that was put together, we weren't quite there. We had to push. Uh, some of the board, some of the board members that were participating in that process, to ensure that that happened, and that was a little bit like it should have been the other way around. Um, we should have, at least the way that I saw it. Once again, I'm trying to keep my own the eye here. Um, I felt that we had to 
that I had to uh, be louder. Um, and it wasn't coming from your DTSC team. Yeah. So that's just the, a productive comment that I felt that it was a disappointment. Well, thank you for that. Um, and this is the first time we've actually had a chance to really touch on this and yes. I've known it. It's kind of been somewhere on my to-do list to have this conversation and I would like to have it more in depth. So I'm going to do what I never do, which is ask for an action item uh, <laughs> for a debrief with um, the board members and with, you know, to talk about the contracting process and what we learned and what we might do differently moving forward. So thank you for that. Um, you know, one of my sayings is bad news is good news. If we have bad news, it gives us an opportunity to do things better. Thank I you. just want to add that we are already in the process of scheduling with Todd for Georgette and I to meet with Todd and do a debrief on the Excite solicitation. So perhaps- we So I want to make you. sure the right people are in that conversation. Okay. I um so I uh, I mean I can take it offline with Todd, but um, you know, there's a contracting team that there's a lot of lot of folks who need to be part of that conversation. Okay. So maybe Swati can help us. Yeah. Great. Okay. Okay. So and just let I'm sorry, just let okay. and I didn't mean it, I didn't wanna uh, I'm trying to be transparent and also be yeah. responsive to our duties and and Although we did get there and there were some changes to the to, to the whole process, which I really appreciate. And I want to acknowledge when we were kind of trying to figure it out, um, how to how to make it better. Um, leadership was responsive, right? Um, you did create a better an opportunity to insert something different. So I really want to acknowledge that. So thank you. And I look forward to debriefing. So I have a couple of other things myself. First of all, I love ICTO, right? I think it's a great <laughs> pivot. Um, I know there was some disappointment that things that were referred to the AG's office didn't rise to the level of their taking action. And instead of just walking away from it, um, you know, the, set, the, the alternative effort was created. And I, I, wanna, I wanna acknowledge that because I think that is an important response to, um, to the disappointment of, of the AG's office. And I'm not criticizing them. They probably have their reasons, but but it fell back and, and you all grabbed it. So I like that. The discussion of, um, that you raised about the schedule on, uh, that you raised, Alexis, on permit appeals and board meetings, I think at our next convening, mm -hmm. let's lay out that annual calendar and look at all the things that we all want to accomplish so we we plan our meetings accordingly and you you know we've got fees you've got appeals you've got our own business so um maybe that should be our priority is to get that calendar maybe we can actually order one of those calendars just kidding yeah. the no, <laughs> no i'm just yes, i'm just kidding know. oh i see okay fine um it's an ongoing thing it's okay um, and then greg since you are on that council, we need you to talk to us about it. We need you to help us be better. So you're on that. We haven't, and so next board meeting, how about a report? Okay. Um, and also find a way to include us all in what you're learning. Um, and I, I just wanted to respond to that. So Greg and I have actually been working with the DEIB council right. to figure out how the board and board staff can engage. So we've actually had a few meetings about well, that. And I didn't know. So, yeah, so we're figuring it out. Um, okay. So we'll, we'll be sure that stays as, as an action item. Question talked about half the staff. I don't remember how many total staff are at DTSC about. Um, you know, is yeah. there an about number? So let me let me just say there are 50 more this month than there were last month. Right. We hired know, 50 people in November. We're very excited. All right. Um, we're, we're somewhere in the 1,300, 1,400 right. neighborhood. I don't remember the exact amount. That's fine. I mean, I wanted people to hear that it's well over 1,000 mm -hmm. and growing and that half of that number is a significant number. So um, for those who weren't aware of, of the size of a team that you manage. So just in the mm -hmm. by the by, and I know your deputies all have their departments, but I wanted to acknowledge that. 
Um, do we have any other questions or comments before we go to the public from the board? Thank you all for that. Uh, public comments on this report. Do we have anybody Thank lined up? Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll now open the floor for public comment on agenda item number five, the DTSC leadership report. I'll first take a poll in person. Anybody wishing to make a comment? Okay, seeing none on Zoom, I'll see if there are any hands raised. I see two hands raised. Um, Jenny Knack, please uh, request accept the staff request to unmute, but before we have you uh, make your comment, I just want to remind those on Zoom um, to only use the Q&A function um, if you have technical difficulties or are unable to make verbal comments. Otherwise, if you do want to make a comment, raise your virtual hand and we will call upon you. So first we have Jenny Knack. You have three minutes. Please state your name and your affiliation. Jenny Knack, Parents Against SSFL. My one and only question uh, pertains to the technical assistance grant. Um, I'm interested in how it works. I haven't done my research and I apologize, but I'm wondering if the applicants for funding get to determine the source of technical assistance, such as the contractors used, or does DTSC provide it through contractors, contractors they choose? I guess what I'm getting at is are the applicants getting to ensure that the technical assistance provided is truly independent technical assistance, or is there a risk of the grants applicants being given technical assistance that's more aligned with industry or polluter interests? And we all understand that there are many risks of biases or bias entering these processes of study designs, interpretations, intentional loopholes or oversights, sampling biases, sensitivity of equipment methods, um, et cetera. So I guess that's my one and only question. The simple answer is it, it is very independent. The groups identify techno, technical ep experts and, and pursue those. I will also put in a plug for one of my favorite organizations, which is an organization called the Environmental Health Network. It's a network of former US EPA, largely US EPA employees. E the US, what did I say? I don't know what I said, but US EPA, former employees who make themselves available to help um, to help um, groups navigate environmental issues. Hmm? <laughs> so at any rate, even in, out, outside of our process, there is another tool available. I'm happy to provide information if somebody wants to get in touch with me. Um, but no, Jenny, uh, it, it is the experts are identified by the applicants. It's we're not we we're not we don't have a hand selected list of potential experts, and we say choose from these folks or you don't get the funding. That's not the way it works. Next questions. Oh, go ahead. yes. Next we have Florence Garabidian on Zoom. Please accept the invitation to unmute. You have three minutes. Please state your name and your affiliation. Thank you. The first thing I want to say is how encouraging it is that the board made this, the decision that they did on the uh, appeal. It's appropriate. It's right. Thank you. And also, hearing a comment from someone in the community saying this is the first time they feel that people are listening to them and how important that is. The next thing I wanna say is the bad news in this meeting is that Carl Palmer is going to retire. I've worked with him, he's a tremendous person and he will be missed. Also, there are other veteran employees at DTSC over this few months that have also retired and it really does leave a gap because they have knowledge and experience and they will be missed as well. Thank you. May I? You're so correct. Um, December is always a tough month for DTSC. A lot of state employees take their retirement, announce their retirements at the end of the year. 
And so we're kind of we've girded our loins for a lot of those announcements, but I can tell you, um, we, we we recently recognized Hanson Pang, who's the head of our Office of Criminal Investigation, who's wrapping up his service. Um, so many employees with more than 30 years are, are leaving the organization, and with that goes a tremendous amount of uh, institutional knowledge. And so we would be remiss if we didn't, number one, appreciate all of their service. If we were to do the math on it, it'd be hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, and also recognize it's sobering. We have a lot to, you know, some programs are doing a really nice job of making sure that younger staff get exposed to those older staff in ways that we try to retain as much knowledge as possible, but it's a challenge, especially with the remote work. Yeah. I believe there was a third hand raised on Zoom. Sheena, can you please help me call their name? Yes, Ivana Castellanos, I'm going to send you a request to unmute. You may go ahead. Please state your name and affiliation. Hi, my name is Ivana Castellanos with Physicians for Social Responsibility, Los Angeles. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, I have two questions today. Um, one is about the SB 673 Cumulative Impacts Regulatory Framework. Um, I think it had been mentioned at a BES meeting, I think back in March, that the there would be workshops taking place in the summer, um, which, you know, didn't, hasn't happened. And I know the website was recently updated and there's like a public engagement survey available there. But I'm just sort of wondering what the updated timeline for the public engagement process is for the development of that revised framework. Ran out of breath there. And... <laughs> My second question, which I'll just ask now, is uh, we had also heard about um, the proposed addition of microplastics and PPD to the candidate chemicals list under safer consumer products. And I haven't been able to follow that closely. So I'm just wondering what the status of that is. I should know the answer to that question, but I know where to point you. OK, um, so. Um, with respect to the 673 uh, regulations and the framework, we have, we've been coalescing throughout the year on a revised framework. We're feeling actually quite good about it. We are very behind, you're right. We had hoped to have workshops this year. It looks unlikely. It is unlikely at this point, given the holiday season, um, but, and we're behind, We it is, I all I can say is it's not that it's not getting attention, it's just that it, you know, we do have some work to do to get it ready for the public engagement. So um, I, what it would be really wonderful is maybe if we could spend, depending on how it works out, maybe in January, it's possible that that could be an agenda item. I don't know. It's possible. Um, but let's see what else comes up, because I know people have a lot of interest on in that. On the microplastics... Um, I'm sorry, my computer's not online. Otherwise, I could pull it up just very, very quickly. Um, the proposal for rulemaking on that. It, here's what I would ask. If you go to dtsc.ca.gov, dtsc.ca.gov forward slash SCP, Safer Consumer Products, dtsc.ca.gov forward slash SCP. If you scroll down on that page, there's a timeline. And I believe the timeline um, should in, you, you may have to search a little bit, but the microplastics should be captured on the timeline for, for what's happening when. Um, alternatively, you can go to our CalSAFER site and comment periods are listed there, uh, including rulemaking, pre-regulatory pre rulemaking um, comment periods as well as regulatory rulemaking comments. We have had a pre-regulatory workshop on this and I'm just blanking on the schedule for the rulemaking, but it's it certainly is moving forward. Thank you for that. Okay, there are no more hands raised on Zoom. Uh, no comments in the Q&A. Um, and there are no Spanish comments. Again, anyone in person wanting to make a comment, please raise your hand. Seeing none, uh, that concludes the public comment portion, Madam Chair.
Great, thank you. So we have some action items, obviously. Um, one of them is to include, when we talk about the calendar, where 673 fits. So that's, that's good, as we're looking at the potential for putting that in January, and since it'll be, it, that meeting's in Ontario, right? Correct? Okay. Um, so anyway, that, that adds to our list of follow-ups with, with you and, um, uh, let me see. Is any board members, final call, anything else, any comments, any, just gratitudes, I think. I think now we send gratitudes. Well, thank you. Thank Dr. you. Williams. And congratulations. It's pretty, the amount of work you've done this year is impressive, to say the least. We feel Thank it. you. Thank you. Thank we you. feel your gratitude. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to take our 10 minute break now um, and quite possibly reorder the agenda a little bit. So don't go away. Um, if you were thinking that uh, you were going to wait until later for the hazardous waste management plan report, I think we're talking about what we're going to move around a little bit. So stay tuned. Uh, give us 10 minutes and uh, we'll see you shortly. Okay, it is now 1115 and the board will break for 10 minutes. Thank you. Reestablishment of quorum. Looks like all members are present. It is now, quick time check, 1131. Uh, we will proceed with agenda item number six with board member reports. Yes, okay. Is um, all members are present. Everybody's focused. Got all that good energy now. I'm sure. Um, and do we find, did Meredith, you get a donut? All right, okay. <clears throat> These are the important things. Uh, coming up. We have board member reports, and I think uh, Georgette and Liz are going to talk about the EJAC, the Environmental Justice Advisory Council, that they are um, board members participating in the development and uh, growth of that, uh, that program. So let's hear from you. All righty. Um, so we went through a series of public comment. Um, took several months to do that along with uh, the full subcommittee, which includes myself and, and Liz, as well as DTSC staff. Uh, the committee has been meeting to, uh, to evaluate the public comment that was gathered and respond to every single comment, um, as well as also deciding what items were going to get amended on the draft framework. So we've been doing that. Um, that has been already concluded. Now DTSC is taking that framework and and, and managing it internally. Um, and that's where we are. Um, at this moment is up to DTSC how they wanna move forward with the EJAC and when they're gonna be concluding um, a final framework. So it's on them. To, to take it to the final one. Okay, so um, that could be an action item for between now and the next meeting um, to get an update from DTSC mm -hmm. on the progress on the EJAC. So let's... Um, I know they're discussing it internally now. So right, it, and it's, hopefully... It's up to them to figure out how to... Yeah, so it would be a good idea to bring it forward to get an update from them and hopefully finalize it. That's great, thank you. Anything from you on that, Liz? Okay, I want to thank, um, I know it was a lot of work. It took time to stand this up and to go through the various iterations for those of you who followed our, our work on the EJAC, um, figuring out how to navigate it, what the board's role could, should, is best to be. Mm -hmm. um, so we've been really fortunate to have Liz and Georgette um, hanging in there, working with the department. And um, so thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah, they're they're looking at the legal concerns. They're also looking at communicating with uh, doing outreach with tribal members and see how that how that representation can look into the the whole process. So they're doing some internal discussions right. and investigations. So you're working. So at with... this point, just want to be very clear: it's on them to move it forward. I understand. And and, and, and you're working with Celine. Yeah, Shirley. Yeah. Yeah, Shirley. Okay, mm -hmm. so she's the. Um... So that'll be good. We can reach out, 
and see where that is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you for yeah. that. Can I also give a report very briefly on CVCI? Please do. Okay, so I've been designated as the lead for CVCI, and it's exciting. Yes, thank um, you. Thank you, Chair. You're welcome. Um, um, if my for, pleasure, anytime. Yes, and for the public, uh, CVCI is the Cleanup in Vulnerable Communities Initiative, which was also created as uh, the, the bill that uh, formed this body also made reference to the creation and allocation of dollars to launch that initiative that DTSC manages. So it is our duty to um, evaluate how they're spending that money. Um, and that is the, the, the process in which we're gonna be embarking on. We had an internal initial meeting right now. We're working on setting up a follow-up meeting with DTSC um, staff to get an update and then we're going to come back um, and the we is myself and staff uh, that will work on bringing forward a proposal and how to move forward in the evaluation process in which we're going to be embarking on. Within that, we're also evaluating, we're looking at best practices from other agencies that might have somewhat similar um, initiatives that can help us pull um, evaluation uh, structures that we might want to utilize, maybe in that embark where we might not find anything, but we're looking at EPA, at a car, which they also have initiatives. So we want to see if they have a process in which they evaluate uh, external evaluation that could help us. So we're not reinventing the wheel, but we're looking at that as well. That's great. What's Do you have a timeline or time frame? What do you anticipate? Yes. Yeah. So I just wanted to remind the board that the board actually has a mandate when it comes to ZVCI and to give the legislature a report. Um, so we are we are going to be working on that report over the next six months and wow. closely understanding CVCI along with DTSC. I know that they're working on briefings for the board members so that they can give updates on the progress of CVCI. So the timeline would be in about six months to have a report to the legislature. But we're also hoping that we also in this briefing with staff, because they're, the, the DTSC is going, they, they just, they're in the second round of issuing the funds. So we wanna make sure that the third round, that if there's findings that we would want to suggest as changes for that distribution that we're influencing the third round um, outside of reporting to the legislature. We want them because that is part of our duties. The, part, the, the intention of this evaluation is to ensure that the money is being spent accordingly. So if there's any, any changes that we would wanna see, we wanna make sure that we're influencing the third round. So that's my goal is that too. Yes, communicating to the legislature is important, but I think it's really important that we're not missing the opportunity to influence the third round of, of issuance of these dollars. So That's we're great. finding that timeline as well. Okay. Um, just to ensure that our process gets to that third round of distributions before they start. Right. That before they do it. Yeah. Right. So for those of you who don't know, there was a special allocation to fund um, CVCI. And I know you're talking about reporting to the legislature. You're talking about like the regular report next August or something before that. It's a it's a written report that a we written report. report that we submit to them. Okay, um, great. But it, I'm sure it'll also be included in our update to the legislature, which usually happens in August when um, Meredith and I are are called in to talk to them about it. So we've probably got two. Two times, right? The time where we submit a re written report and then we think about how we want the committee that the joint committee that is the oversight committee for this whole, for the board and DTSC, we'd want to be able to do that. I think we've, thank you for that. Um, I think we have some agenda changes. I want to make note that in on the original agenda, uh, we had the legislative update, which would have occurred during um, Dr. Williams' uh, time frame. Um, with, but as I mentioned earlier, um, Deanna will be arriving 
We'll have her presentation after lunch. Her presentation will be after lunch because she had a flight delay. Um, so we have that. So thank you for that. Uh, other board reports? Okay, Department of Defense liaison. Under SB 158, the board has one of us as a liaison to the Department of Defense. I am that person presently. And DTSC regularly convenes with the branches of the Defense Department, primarily around facilities, obviously in California and issues that arise from that. Several weeks ago, um, one of the regular um, meetings occurred and the focus of that meeting relates to the board's fee setting authority that as you heard, will be coming up in future meetings. DOD, if you think about, um, let me bring you an example um, to illustrate the point. They are duty bound to estimate how much hazardous waste they produce and from that pay into a couple of fee accounts, um, certain amounts of revenue. Um, and that happens through a third party agency in California. There's a category of waste, universal waste, which is not manifested as it is moved around. And it is therefore perhaps harder to estimate the amount of waste generated and therefore the amount of fee revenue owed. That is an issue that DOD has estimated and paid, but it is worth working through that, that policy calculation and discussion with the Department of Toxic Substances Control to resolve that for the current and future fee years. So that discussion, I would just report, is underway. I don't um, believe I have anything particularly to add to that um, policy discussion at the moment, but as that issue is resolved, it would be very helpful and will inform other forms of universal waste generated around the state. That's it. Thank you for that. Uh, okay, Liz, I think uh, you're going to update us on the Ecobat information meeting that you attended. Part of the um, regular reporting by the board are activities that they conducted from the last board meeting, engagements, even if the issue may have been resolved or feels past tense, we want to get into the record, the activities of the board, and be transparent about what we do with our time uh, or, you know, between board meetings. Yes, thank you. Um, so this is a, as, as the SoCal local board member, I've attended uh, the Ecobed informational meetings. Um, this last one occurred on the 8th of November here at the same community center. And both, um, actually, uh, Linda Ocampo and Evelyn Nuno were also present. Um, and some of the information, um, the purpose of the meeting was to have DTSC provide the community presentations um, to talk about the permit process and how uh, the folks can be can participate in the in the permit process for Ecovat, um, and they also provided updates on some of the sampling that's occurred around the community. And so DTSC talked about how they um, sent out the public notice to folks who are subscribed to their e list, mm -hmm. and how they also included a notice in the San Gabriel Valley Times. Um, some of the um, highlights from the public comments uh, related to. Uh, concerns about uh, having the a, a more thorough sampling process throughout the community to um, not in, only include uh, I think one or two schools, but to to really sample throughout most of the schools um, and to wait on a decision for the permit until um, the 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 sampling throughout the community is completed. Um, just to go back to to for the board to keep in mind some of the the uh, regulatory agencies involved with Ecobad besides DTSC, there's the AQMD, the South Coast Air Mal South Coast Air Quality Management District, who oversees um, the air emissions, the LA County Water Quality Control Board, the Sanitation District, who um, who who oversees the treated wastewater. Um, from, from the site, LA County Fire, who is, I believe, the Coupa, and of course, DTSC, who, who regulates the hazardous uh, waste from the property. 
and, and, and oversees the cleanup. Um, and uh, yeah, and 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 um, I, I believe a lot of the community members who are very outspoken at that um, hearing were also present yesterday and expressed a lot of the similar concerns that we've heard. Um, but um, like I said, most of them really pointed to um, creating a more thorough process of sampling um, before um, before having the permit decision and and really uh, wanted to to expand the sampling area as well. Um, they noted that um, that DTSC's response to that was that the the more thorough sampling plan is going to depend on the sampling results from what they've done so far. Um, but um, so that that's pretty much where where a summary of the meeting. Thank you for that. And one item that we're, there was a fiber tech tour that um, uh, Georgette, you'll report on and Sushma um, add to, yeah. Yeah. So another site visit that we did, um, both myself and member Sushma Bhatia, along with uh, Staff Evelyn Nielsen and Linda Campo, we visited um, Fiber Tech, um, and I believe I do remember if we went a separate look time. Um, and as you all, well, just in terms of reporting, um, Fiber Tech um, is a company that is one of the longest permitting applicant holders with. Uh, a decision making pending um, as we speak for a uh, new permit um, currently is under, the permit is currently under review. And we have heard in the past during some of our meetings, um, public comments on this uh, facility, which is a facility that is uh, sited in an industrial area but also is close to residential and schools. This facility was uh, established in terms of operating it since 1984. And during our visit, there was a, a presentation that was shared with us uh, that we're trying to um, acquire so we can put it in a, on the record and um, hopefully they'll, they'll do that. Um, just so we're fully transparent on the information that we're gathering versus just the notes that we are taking during the during during the, the the conversation, but they went through the whole process of the types of um the, the, uh, activities that they are permitted or well they were permitted to do, um from recycling various different materials to also the areas that they're trying to um. Uh, what the conditions of the permit that they're waiting on from DTSC, the areas that they're trying to improve and expand. Uh, we, aside from the presentation, we also took a small tour to just walk the facilities. Um, and uh, yeah, so thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sushma, do you want to, who else went? Did you want to add something? Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to highlight something that came up during my visit to the site, and I'm hoping um, Linda can elaborate since it was a question, the discussion came from a question from Linda, um, our, our staff engineer, but it, it was related to the VSP scoring. The um, Somebody from the facility mentioned um, some discrepancy in some of the VSP scoring because of, of the way that it's kind of developed and different um, factions between DTSC issue the score. And so to me, it really brought up uh, maybe the a sense that we, that there needs to be a clearer understanding of how the VSP is, score is issued. And um, and it's something that, that we should definitely also look into. And, and um, I don't know if there's anything you can add, Linda. Clarity for the way that that who it's who was unclear about the scoring. Um, who the, the yeah, attorney, yeah, the attorney for FiberTech. The attorney for so Fibertech. apparently there are three different scores 
for the same issue that they were uh, cited for. Um, so that was just to illustrate how there's different um, evaluations going on around the VFP um, scoring. And so I think Wayne was willing to provide some information at, at a, some point in the future on how they evaluate. There, there's different units within DTSC that perceive or have a different perspective on how the CSP scoring is evaluated. That was my understanding. Is there an outcome from this? Are we like, has it, have we asked DTSC to, are you doing that now? I'm trying I'm to doing understand. That now. <laughs> We're doing that now, apparently. Um, you said, had you spoken with Wayne about it? Um, that was during one of our, the last visit okay. with fiber type with Wayne uh, present. So I, we don't want to put you in the spot, Wayne, but. So um, we won't put you on the spot now unless you want to be Wayne um, or, or Katie. Um, because oh, this, Katie will this provide some info. Me, so yeah. I'm not sure what to do with it, but thank you. <clears throat> okay. Um, I will take this back and get back to you on the VSP score for FibroTech and any questions they have. So if you can tell me specifically what issues they were flagging. Because we do have one unit in DTSC um, that's responsible every year for calculating the VSP scores. Mm -hmm. So it should be very clear, and I, I want to make sure we get back to the facility as well on this. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so the contact person, the depth of the question, and then we'll come back and report that back out at the next meeting once we get the answer from Katie. Thank you for raising that. Yeah. I'll add one thing that hasn't been said so far, which is FibroTech has had a long history with DTSC, and part of the long history is because of legacy hexavalent chromium contamination within that entire community. Uh, there are efforts, including a, an agreement in place with EPA to clean up some of the hexavalent chromium and to prevent the plume from uh, continuing to go into communities and spread out, but these are really difficult, longer-term issues that will get solved over the many, many years to come. Uh, I think the focus now is to make sure that as FibroTech continues to operate, it's doing so in a, in a health-protective way, and there's no uh, hexavalent chromium being released into the communities. So there's an extensive network of uh, groundwater monitors and so on to uh, make sure that uh, this is being continually monitored. But uh, we understand from DTSC or from FibroTech and DTSC that a decision is pending. So we're all looking forward to when that happened. Does anyone from DTSC have a date as to when to expect a a decision on FibroTech from a decision? A long walk up just to tell you that it's currently anticipated to be in March. For the... Oh, sorry. Board member, Chair Rizzo, members of the board. My name is Wayne Lorenzen. I manage the permitting division at DTSC. We're expecting a permit decision for FiberTech in March. Thank you very much, Wayne. <clears throat> is there anything else on FiberTech, aka PTI? No? Okay. Uh, so any board discussion on the reports that we all just received? from other board members. I think we interrupt you due during it, so we probably got our questions out. Go ahead, Liz. I did have a question for for for, for Georgette regarding CVCI. Um, is there a plan to include um, previous community concerns related to the uh, recipients of the, the first um, set of, of um, dispersals. And Georgette, I can add to that if, after you're done. But the, the quick answer is at this moment, we're just right now having beginning conversations to set up the process. Um, and obviously we have had initial conversations here on the board where we had that um, the report from staff, I forget when, I uh, we were up north, I don't remember when that month was when we were 
when we first heard it, it was so, so a while back. Um, and we were hearing from some of the folks on on some of the awarding and some of the awards issue concerns. So will it be incorporated? Uh, yes. Um, how? I don't know yet, but we're literally right now in beginning initial conversations. So it's hard to be more specific. So in terms of CVCI, the board mandate, it's, it's very focused on two things. It's the liquidation of the funds and then what are the public health benefits. So those are the two pieces that we're going to focus on first. And then as we're having conversations with DTSE, expand if needed, but making sure that we are looking at those two mandates and understanding what the liquida liquidation of funds as well as the public health benefits are for CBCI. That was helpful, thank you. I hadn't paid that close attention to that, so I appreciate that. All right, uh, any other board members or staff questions or comments on the report so far? Public comment or responses to the board members' reports? Thank you, Madam Chair. We'll now open the floor for public comment on agenda okay. item number six for board member reports. I'll take a poll in the room first. Anybody wishing to make a public comment in person? Seeing none, just a quick scan. Uh, I'll now go on to Zoom participants. Please raise your virtual hand if you would like to uh, make a public comment on agenda item number six. I do not see any hands raised. I'm gonna take a quick look into Q&A to see if anybody has um, mentioned anything on there. Nothing on there, checking with Spanish interpreters to see if there are any Spanish comments. Okay, I just got a message. No Spanish comments uh, from the interpreters. Um, so I guess that will close public comment for this agenda item, Madam Chair. Right, thank you. Uh, now we'll go on to um, the very um, high pressure item of the minutes. We'll be <laughs> reviewing and approving the July and September minutes, which um, you know is usually a very robust discussion. Um, okay, Madam Chair, yes. I I move that our board adopt the July and September Board of Environmental Safety minutes. Do we have a second? Okay, were you not at both? No. <laughs> I'd like to amend my motion since we had different um, attendance. Um, Madam Chair, I move that we approve the July 2023 Board of Environmental Safety meeting minutes. Can I have a second? I second. Any discussion? We can approve. Will you call the roll, please? Sure. From I'll call the roll from left to right. Uh, is that okay? Yep. Yeah, whatever. Uh, Member Gomez? Yes, that's an I for member Gomez. Um, board member Ruiz. I abstain. I was not present. Okay, abstention from member Ruiz. Sushma Batia. Yes. I. Okay, Chair Rizzo. Yes. That's an I. I. Vice Chair. I. Okay. Motion. So, yes, motion passed. Three eyes, one abstention. I'm sorry, that's four yeah. eyes, one abstention. Madam Chair, I move that we adopt the September Board of Environmental Safety Minutes. Do we have a second? I second. Call the vote, please. Member Gomez? No, abstaining. That's an abstention from Member Gomez. Uh, Board Member Ruiz? Yes. Aye. Sushma? Yes. Chair Rizzo? Yes. Vice Chair Hacker? Yes. Okay. That is four eyes, one abstention for the September meeting minutes. Madam Chair? Phew, we got through that. Okay. Um, 
Now, moving right along, uh, we are very happy to welcome Katie Butler, um, who will give us a report on the hazardous waste management report slash plan. Um, so you'll welcome Katie. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, members of the board. My name is Katie Butler. I'm the Deputy Director of the Hazardous Waste Management Program. And Ryan Dominguez, who's the Hazardous Waste Management Plan Unit Supervisor, he's on the line as well. And he was instrumental, him, him and his team, in putting this report together along with Diana Peebler. Uh, we are pleased to announce the first Hazardous Waste Management Report for California was published on our website on Tuesday, November 28th. So you can go on our website and check it out now. This report was developed with input from a very wide variety of stakeholders across the state and will be used to guide our hazardous waste management planning in California. I'm extremely grateful for the extensive stakeholder participation in both of the workshops we held over the summer. Um, and this final report it really provides a wealth of information on traditional aspects of our hazardous waste management system, such as types, amounts of hazardous waste generated, transportation modes, distances that hazardous waste travels, and the destination facilities and where they're located, and a first look at the communities around those destination facilities. Additionally, the report, the report lays the groundwork for planning efforts to move beyond our tra traditional hazardous waste management system framework, especially to address environmental and health inequities. So now our team is very excited to turn their focus to the future planning activities, developing a roadmap for our state that is sustainable, supportive of a circular economy, and protective of all Californians, especially those who are most vulnerable. We are committed to exploring new ways to incentivize hazardous waste reduction, uh, assess whether current hazardous waste criteria should be updated to reflect advances in science and te technology or analytical methods that are new and evaluate emerging contaminants. So collectively, we will need to be forward thinking while also relying on proven and scientific practices. Um, all of this cannot be done without the continued stakeholder engagement and participation that will only make our effort, these plans and strategies stronger, more impactful. Um, so again, thank you to our many partners and stakeholders who reviewed and commented on this report. Thank you to the board uh, for spending a lot of time reviewing the report, um, providing your feedback and input, and to the subcommittee members who spent a lot of time with our staff as well. Um, uh, hundreds of pages of the reports and appendices, so thank you for that. Uh, and uh, you know, we believe that we, we were able to start a constructive dialogue on what future planning may look like. Many of the comments we received were actually geared towards the planning activities. So we plan to use these comments uh, and all the input we've received to date to shape that draft framework for the plan that we come out with. Uh, and we're geared up, we're looking forward to rolling out these engagement activities uh, beginning in March, 2024. Um, so again, energized by the level of interest and support to date, and it truly reflects the importance of this effort. Um, so that's my status update. And I understand the subcommittee may have a report, a verbal report for us to receive as well. Yes, uh, Sushma and Liz, who are the subcommittee working um, with DTSC team uh, on on you know giving feedback. We also had our own discussions at board meetings, and you presented, which was great, and we got feedback from the public at those meetings. So there was quite an engagement because people are really concerned. And we all know the legislature's really interested in this. The governor's interested in it. Probably states around the country are interested in it. So uh, no pressure. Um, but, the, um, but the report is, is a fabulous foundation. And I really want to encourage uh, 
everyone who cares about this issue and winds up bringing things to us, having the basis of having read the report will give you language and understanding to be an effective advocate for how you're thinking about it. So I really do want to encourage that read. Um, okay, so let's go to Sushma and Liz, and then we'll go to questions, Katie, okay? Before we go into our recommendations, I wanted to thank um, the, the Hazardous Waste Management Plan uh, folks for for work for their time and working with us. Um, it, it has been a very extensive collaboration. We've met um, at least once a month um, throughout you know throughout uh, the, the year, and it's it's been really great to to be able to provide our input to be able to review the report and and to really um, you know be there and 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 participate in at the workshops um, and so. Even with that, I also want to thank the public, the stakeholders, the different stakeholders, folks from industry, folks from the communities affected by some of the, the hazardous waste, which most of is actually contaminated waste. And so I know that a lot of folks um, that are part of um, the community are definitely interested in in where this, you know, this hazardous waste ends up. And so I really, really want to thank um, folks uh, for providing their their ideas and their concerns and their comments to be part of this report. I don't know if you want to add anything. I think that's a thumbs up for those of you who uh, are not seeing Sushma. And those don't come easily or readily. So um, that's, a, that's a real plus, Katie. You get a thumbs up from Sushma. I wait weeks for that. So thank you. Uh, Okay, do we so, have any so, um, no. qu questions? Oh, you're we not done. Oh, oh, good. Okay. <laughs> so for our recommendations uh, for the planning uh, portion of, of, of this process, um, from what we gathered, uh, Sushma and I, um, is really to start off with is, is are the data gaps. Um, we are really encouraging DTSC uh, staff to continue to invest in in really strengthening, strengthening the data fidelity uh, to really be able to um, push for more quality and have a more complete um, data set um, because we are technically the leader in, in, in national, the national leader in hazardous waste management planning. Um, part of this was really uh, figuring out how to to consolidate a lot of the information, how to uh, make it so that it's not unknown, so that um, companies that are reporting hazardous waste do so in in, in units that 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 match that that makes sense for hazardous waste management, and and we understand that it's it would be a very hard endeavor because a lot of these systems have been set in place for various years, but um, we really do encourage um, the department to push to, it, or figure out how to harmonize um, these reporting systems to ensure that the quality um, and other fields are cohesive and standardized. And this, we feel like this will make it easier for future years because these reports do have to, um, you know, this isn't the last report. <laughs> um, they do happen every three years, so. Um, Another um, area that we want to encourage the department is uh, related to enforcement. Uh, we heard a lot of comments um, asking for um, strengthening that that field to to the the to push the hazardous waste management plan to, um, the, the hazardous waste management group to work with enforcement to increase compliance rates and and to start with serial violators and to coordinate and um, really work uh, through uh, SB 673 um, to to provide um, tiered penalties and other mechanisms tailored to drive expedited compliance. Okay, so for those of you that are tracking our recommendations, we have five recommendations. Liz covered the first two. One is on data fidelity and quality, and the second one was on enforcement. The third one is on source reduction. So we've heard talked with you already about this in your team, Katie, is we would love to see a refreshed or updated pollution prevention source reduction 2.0 program. And the, the goal here is reduction continues to matter. So how might we continue to invest in it? 
uh, perhaps using the data from the hazardous waste management report to create this new version of the program uh, that's focused on the emerging categories of things. It doesn't have to be for every everything within the report. Second is how might we drive greater cohesion between the hazardous waste management program and the safer consumer products? And mm -hmm. Lots of great uh, progress made on the safer consumer products, but perhaps there's a way to look at the data coming from the hazardous waste management report and have the safer consumer products team evaluate alternatives for specific categories mm -hmm. and and institute some market moving programs that will help us start to track reductions perhaps in the hazardous waste management report mechanism. So that was number three. And number four is focused on R&D and innovation. Again, not a surprise to you, you've heard us talk about this before, which is we would love to see, we talk, talked about how we are a national leader now in collecting information on hazardous waste management uh, in California, how might we also become a leader in driving innovation, uh, not just um, generating new mechanisms to manage our, our hazardous waste within the state, but also instituting them more quickly uh, within the state. So to, to that end, we have a few suggestions. Uh, one was, is if there isn't already a mechanism to inv involve the uh, academic institutions in California, creating some sort of a round table to make sure the innovation is flowing and happening here, uh, possibly in partnership with the business community, uh, creating some sort of innovation challenge program, uh, possibly with the financial incentives to attract new ideas and new thinking on on specific categories of waste emerging from the hazardous waste management report, and then creating more structured programs that allow us to pilot, allow business community to pilot some of those on-site remediation um, uh, innovate, uh, innovations. I'm going to hand it back to Liz for the last one. So for the last recommendation, uh, we really want to push the department to uh, increase its uh, hazardous waste leadership in, in collaboration with with uh, folks from the community, folks from industry, uh, and and to really identify challenging hazardous waste ca categories and themes that may require a broader policy or pro programmatic approach and intervention beyond the purview of DTSC alone. So one example is the issue of transporting hazardous waste outside of the state. Uh, that's that's a very we understand that's a very difficult uh endeavor but we would like to push the department to see um to figure out how, and, and think about how how might the state handle the hazardous waste generated by the state within the state boundary um how another example is areas where it makes sense for us to pursue producer responsibility programs Sometimes DTSC is identified as the responsible party, um, and it might seem easier to export waste outside, um, but we really would like to push the department to, to figure out um, how to reduce that waste and to keep you know whatever waste is generated within mm -hmm. our state borders to really set that example. Um, and uh, in a more technical level, uh, we also want to push to the department to provide more clarity on every public comment received. Uh, we, you know, we understand that there's a plan to really work on engaging with the public on the on the on the plan that's uh, coming up within this year. But um, with those with, with within those engagement, we really would like to see the department uh, provide um, specific uh, responses to the public comments and and really. Uh, hear and and listen to what the com what the public comments are and um and and address them in, in purview of of you know the mandate to to increase transparency and collaboration wow okay you really worked hard on that um how, katie do you uh have any responses to our subcommittee or just five step five just step five five things five. which which I would love to see that um, report in writing from you too, so we could all look at it as a board. Um, we're working with DTSC's hazardous waste management team. We have regular meetings with right. them. And so we're hoping at the January or maybe the March board meeting, we'll have a timeline and um, these talking points in a more formal way for to share with the public as well. So we hope right. to do that. It's a lot to consume, read off to the rest of the board, right? And so if if the endorsement of the staff board is important to you, then it's important that we get to see it in a way where we could say we agree as a board. 
because right now this is a subcommittee recommendation, which is invaluable. I'm not minimizing it, but hearing it for the first time, I can't remember all five of them. I don't know if anybody else can. There will be a quiz after this. So. There will be a quiz. That's what I was afraid of. And so I think the key will be if you could transfer that into a written report to us so we could all look at it and give you comments back, right? How do we feel as the rest of our team, as our engineer, as our, you know, uh, board members? Uh, and, and it may very well be, yes, but we may have things we want to contribute to that thinking. No, and so. it's definitely an, an, an ongoing endeavor. And, and I wanted to do, I, I do want to commend the staff for their participation in the, the recent Cal Matters uh, hearing. Um, it was very informative. The comments received were very informative and 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 um, it was a very good uh, dialogue to, to listen to and, and also include within our understanding of the hazardous waste management plan and and, and, and hearing outside voices from, from throughout the state. Great, thank you. It was great. You did great at that uh, Cal Matters. I think most of us, if you haven't watched it, I'm sure it's posted somewhere and it's definitely on YouTube. Um, that was uh, that was really good. So congratulations on that. Any, thank you. Any thoughts or comments? I really back? appreciate uh, the real-time feedback from the subcommittee. It helps us keep the ball rolling, make sure we're aligned as a department with the board's vision because the board will have that important job of uh, determining the plan approval in March, 2025. So we look forward to our ongoing discussions and collaboration on this. And thank you for giving it some really thoughtful consideration. Thank you. Questions and comments, Georgette? Hello. I have a question and my question is not in the content, but more of a timeline. Maybe it's on the, on the website, I was trying to look pretty quickly, but I didn't see it. Um, so the report is out for public comment. So the report was finalized. This is the hazardous okay. waste management report. Um, and we finalized it after several months of receiving comments and holding workshops. Okay. And this is the baseline information. Got it. So this report will inform the plan that we're now working on developing. And we essentially have about a year to put this plan together to allow us enough time to finalize it and present it to you all in March, 2025. Got it, mm -hmm. thank you. Any other comments, questions from staff or board for um, Katie Butler? I like saying Katie Butler. I don't know, it kind of goes to the I get that a lot. <laughs> I don't say Wayne Lorenzen, but I say Katie Butler. So. <laughs> Um, I thank you for that. Um, it's been an amazing, um, uh, just from s when we started to think, oh, there's this thing called a hazardous waste management report. Oh, really? Yeah, we're going to be involved in that. Wow. Um, that's a, a very deep dive. And I really, really do encourage everybody um, to read it. It informs how you think about most of the work that we will wind up doing. Um, and I don't know what that noise was, but we're going to ignore it. Um, okay, and thank you for the two of you. I know that was a heavy lift, and, and it's really much appreciated. I think our next um, public comment, questions. Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I will now open the floor for agenda item number eight. For those following along online, uh, we've updated the agenda item, so we move things around. This is now agenda item number eight. Uh, the Hazardous Waste Management Plan. I'll take a quick poll in the room if there's anybody that wants to uh, comment. Uh, we have one hand raised. Uh, you may come up to the podium. I see two hands raised on Zoom. And we have... Uh, yes, agenda uh, item number nine, just... For the record, I know it's hard to. It's right. It's a technically yeah. agenda item number nine. Um, you have three minutes uh, for the in person comment. You may state your name and affiliation. 
I'm so nervous. Hi, I'm um, Deja McCauley with PSRLA, Physicians for Social Responsibility Los Angeles. Um, thank you all for your presentations today. Um, I've been, I was supposed to just listen, but now I have a question. Um, I really um, liked what the BES just proposed for recommendations for the hazardous waste management program. And I'm wondering um, if you all will be creating like a formal report or something that will be published online, because I would love to share this with some of the, our other partners and people who do like focus heavily on like DTSE work and reform. Um, but I really like them. It was a lot, but I, I took some notes and I think they're really, really good, especially the piece around enforcement and cohesion among the hazardous waste management program and then the safer consumer products. So I think they can inform each other and they should be working together. Um, so yeah, just wanted to know if there's a timeline on when that will be released. Well, the recommendations are part of our minutes, basically. So as soon, within weeks, um, everything that came out of this meeting will be online. So you'll be able to see it online as, yeah. It'll say subcommittee. We'll, we'll yeah. also, um, for the, either the January or the March board meeting, we'll have a more formal report published with the timeline of the different workshops and right. um, the board also, once DTSC provides the board the hazardous waste management plan, we're required to hold three hearings throughout the state. And so we'll have a tentative timeline on that published also, hopefully in the next several months. We're still working with DTSC's team and our team to fine tune that, but hopefully by either the January or the March uh, board meeting, we'll have more formal documents. Great, thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much. Um, another quick poll in the room. Anybody else want to comment in person? Seeing none, I'll move on to Zoom participants. I see the first hand raised is by Billy Huck. Please accept the request to unmute from one of our staff. Please state your name and your affiliation. You have three minutes. Did we lose Billy? We can't hear you. I'm gonna, I'll, I'll come back to you. I'll move on to uh, the second hand raised. I have Ivana Castellanos. Please state your name and your affiliation. You have three minutes when you're ready. Thank you. Um, yeah, again, again, I'm Ivana Castellanos, also with PSR Layer, Physicians for Social Responsibility, Los Angeles. Um, again, I have a couple of um, questions really. And the first is just w wondering about the plans for ongoing public engagement opportunities. Um, thanks to, I think the BES just said that they'll be holding three hearings throughout the state once the draft of the plan is ready. But I'm just wondering if there will be any other public engagement opportunities or um, how long the comment period will be for that draft plan since um, I know some of us had trouble with the length of the period this time, given the depth of the, the document. And then the second question I had um, was, I did see that you all released the public comments alongside the final report a couple of days ago, which I really do appreciate and I look forward to reviewing. And I'm just wondering if um, the hazardous waste plan report team can maybe speak to some of the emerging themes that came up in those comments and what updates were made to the report as a result or how those comments might impact the process for the statewide plan. Thank you. We've asked Katie Butler to respond. Okay, thank you. Um, as far as communication and timeline for public engagement, great question. And I mentioned that we're working on an outline of the plan now that has specific draft goals, priority actions. Uh, and so we're taking the these couple months to work internally and then beginning at next year at the beginning of 2024, right around the corner, um, we'll start communicating out what the plans for spring looks like for the workshops that will begin in the spring. 
So you can look forward to that public engagement starting back up again next spring. Um, and then as far as the comments that we received, uh, and I'm really glad that board member Ruiz commented on this, the importance of being responsive to the comments. Um, you are not gonna see a response to comments in that final report. Like you mentioned, the comments are attached and the many letters we received um, and we wanted to acknowledge them. Uh, we did make some changes to the report based on those comments, um, but they were mainly um, any kind of technical sort of data focused type of comment that was relevant to the report information um, and clarifying um, or making sure that our data was presented in an accurate way. So those are the types of um, comments and changes that we focused on. Um, there were a lot of great suggestions on um, certain data that we should look at in the future. And uh, we did not add any new pieces of data or um, new data sources to this iteration of the report, but we're filing those away so that when we come out with the next iteration of the report, we have to do this every three years, publish another report. Um, so we're, you know, our staff are already looking into additional data sources that were suggested in those comments, um, ways that we can fill data gaps going forward. And I'm glad that the subcommittee mentioned that data fidelity, data quality, because that really is the backbone of all of our work. And our outputs are only as good as our inputs, right? So we have to make sure we have a strong, robust data system behind all of this and continue to work to improve that. Um, and, and that is top of mind for us. So that was one thing that came out of the comments. Uh, one other major theme I want to touch on was looking at all of this work um, through, uh, you know, a health equity or impact lens. And um, that's something that Ingrid, you know, touched again on recently in the Cal Matters panel. Uh, and that is an important lens for all of us to have as we go forward in this work. Um, and that was a common thread through a lot of the comments. Um, and then I, I would say innovation came up as well uh, and making sure that we're staying on top of the latest trends, technologies available. Um, and there is an openness and receptiveness across many stakeholders now to think about, okay, how can we do things differently if it's going to mean less impacts or be more effective or more efficient? So that's just to touch on a few themes. That was great, yeah. thank you. And then going forward, we will put together uh, a plan on how to be responsive to comments that we continue to receive so that we can reflect those in the, the final plan like you asked. Yeah. Thank you for that. Thank you. The next, the last um, hand raise that I see on Zoom is from Billy Puck. We'll try this again, sorry. Um, please re uh, accept the request to unmute. Hopefully we can hear you this time. Hello, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you, thank you. Okay, my name is can Billy Fogg. I am from the Santa Clara County. Um, thank you for your uh, plan and the presentation is really great. Um, one uh, well, couple question that I want to ask is, is DTSC looking in the future partnering with other departments that would have impact to your capacity in terms of hazardous waste generations. The main reason this comes up is um, a lot of environmental program like CARP, California Air Resources Board, um, California um, Water uh, Resources Board, they came up with their own initiative and then create their own criteria that impact essentially the generation of hazardous waste. And because of that, I didn't see on the report how to collaborate with other agencies within just Cal EPA alone and how to address all this um, collaborative effort instead of silo of what just DTSC is been doing great. I, I just want to point it out. Um, 
especially one of the thing that it triggered my my thought on this is because of Gavin Newsom had the press release in May of this year about the new affordable housing cutting all the red tape from CEQA. And you probably know some of the CEQA requirement require hazardous waste um, um, uh, assessment. And main thing that because I came from Malawi jurisdiction where they have a lot of issues with contaminated soil due to the land use issues. Um, they have to expedite, basically just um, excavate a lot of contaminated soil in order to build. And is that the only way to actually handle this in terms of generation of hazardous waste? So this is something that I want you guys to think about for the future, how other legislation that would, would pass would impact this plan in general, because at the end of the day, we don't want to live in a contaminated environment in California, but a lot of red tape is cutting. And then without any collaboration with other agencies, DTSC just burdened with hazardous waste to manage it siloly. I don't think that's great. And from the environmental justice perspective, that's also wrong because it could just put in a single community into uh, the focus. Thank you. Oh, one last thing I forgot to ask. If you guys can cons uh, consider the extensive producer responsibility a factor for the future, that would be good too. Great, thank you so much. Any um, response to that? Um, from anyone? No? Okay, I think that's important. Um, input and feedback, thank you for that. Okay, that, that concludes our, um, sorry, <laughs> we don't have any additional hands raised on Zoom. I checked with our interpreters if we have any Spanish comments, but I do see one hand raised uh, in person. If you'd like to come up, uh, this is for agenda item number nine. Is that what you wanted to comment on for hazardous? This is about the hazardous waste management report plan, public comment, for items not on the agenda is after lunch. Correct. Okay, I had a feeling I could <laughs> read your mind. Um, thank you. Okay, so we don't have any additional hands raised for agenda item number nine, none in Zoom or Spanish uh, Great. interpreter line. So that concludes public comment for agenda item number nine. Do you have anything? Okay, great. We're going to take about a 30, 35 minute lunch break. We'll truncate it, then we'll come back for um, public comments items not on the agenda and a legislative update. Welcome, Deanna. And uh, then we'll, we'll begin the conclusion of the meeting with um, a reflection on the action items. And we'll, uh, Alexis Hacker will review those and we'll have concurrence that we caught them all and then if there are any closing remarks. So um, let's take a break. And if you want a donut, just ask me. Thank you. Thank you, it is 12.32. The board will come back in about 30 or 35 minutes. Welcome back everyone. It is now 1.10 and I will now call um, to reestablish quorum. Is that all right, Madam Chair? Please do. Okay, uh, I see that all members are present and have returned from lunch. Um, a quorum is reestablished. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we are now going to have public forum, which is public comments for items not on the agenda. There's one presentation that will kick it off and then we will go to public comments in the room and or on on Zoom. So um, you want to wait until the in the rooms are to announce how to be remote? Yes. So <clears throat> let me find my bearing. Yeah. Here. Yes. Thank you. So I'd like to remind everyone that we have comment cards for those that want to participate um, in the public forum for agenda item number eight. Um, Get I, I have granted an extension to five minutes for this speaker um, to open our presentations. And other than that, we'll stick with the three minutes. 
Yes, thank you. So again, uh, we did receive our online um, signups from online. We will begin with the first one, Jaime Sanchez, who did um, request for a five minute extension and it was granted. So uh, please state your name and affiliation and you have five minutes. My name is Jaime Sanchez. I am a resident of Los Nietos and a member of Neighbors Against FiberTech. Neighbors Against FiberTech are residents of Los Nietos and Santa Fe Springs. We have, we reiterate our request that the DTSC deny the hazardous waste permit for FiberTech. The request is based on the historic and ongoing failure of FiberTech to comply with the law, regulations, and policies governing hazardous materials and hazardous waste. Simply stated, FiberTech's violation record is egregious. It's reasonable to assume that if you had a serial killer in your neighborhood, you would be extremely concerned and that you would want the authorities to do everything possible to stop the perpetrator from causing further harm. It is our opinion that FiberTech is a serial polluter and we are extremely concerned. And we want the DTSC to do everything possible to stop them from continuing to violate the law, which includes denial of the proposed permit and the cleanup of the contamination at the facility. In our previous presentations to the board, we have raised issues of lack of due process by TDSC, failure of the DTSC to address concerns raised with the proposed permit, failure of DTSC to comply with SB 673, specifically community protection, cumulative impacts, and community vulnerability. We have raised the appalling enforcement history of FiberTech, FiberTech's judgment and penalties for ongoing violations, faulty violation scoring procedures, and element five of the uh, Cal EPA DTSC draft deliberative document dated May 2021. Cal EPA DTSC draft deliberative document states in pertinent parts. In this document, the department provides a more detailed draft methodology for integrating potential facility impacts and community vulnerabilities into the department's permitting process for hazardous waste facilities and for determining facility actions to enhance community protection. To simply propose this language while failing to implement its intent is a fallacy an alternative truth and disinformation. For example, DTSC proposes to not only grant FiberTech the permit, but also allow expansion of the capacity for hazardous waste and processing by almost double the amount. Question, how does this conduct by DTSC enhance community protection? Answer, it does not. It de facto increases both the potential for a cumulative impact and community vulnerability. Element five of the same document addresses decisions to revoke or deny a permit. It states in pertinent part, and this element describes how certain criteria, including presence of environmental and health risks to nearby populations would be included in regulations as a basis for a decision to deny a permit. It addresses standards, protections, and compliance. And yet, despite this language, the DTSC has failed to deny FiberTech's permit. During the course of President Reagan's presidency, he went and said something to the effect, if not us who, and if, and if not now, when? He made this statement in reference to an international crisis and in reference to the United States as an international leader and its role in protecting democracy. Neighbors Against FiberTech applies the same significance to the Department of Toxic Substances Control. If not the DTSC, then who? And if not now, when? If the DTSC does not fulfill its mandate to protect the public and the environment against toxic substances, then who? And if not now, when? If the DTSC does not deny the hazardous waste permit for serial polluters like FiberTech, then who? And if not now, when? 
There is one minute. There is no clearer example for a permit denial than FiberTech, and there is no clearer evidence for DTSC for doing so than now. Neighbors Against FiberTech respectfully request that DTC, DTSC fulfill its mandate and not continue to maintain the status quo. We also respectfully request that BES fulfill its mandate and assert its influence over DTSC and exercise its authority in protecting the public. Thank you. Great, thank you, Jaime. The next person- Thank you, Jaime. The next person we have from our online signups is Jacob Paradise. Do we have Jacob on the Zoom or in person? I'm not seeing, <clears throat> I'm not seeing on him, him on Zoom or in person. Um, but I just want to reiterate uh, that this is for agenda item number eight for items not on the agenda. We have allotted 30 minutes for today's public forum, and I only see one hand raised on Zoom. Um, so I will go to if I since I don't see Jacob from our online signups, I'll go back to in person comments, seeing if I'm going to take a poll to see if anybody in person would like to make a public comment. Right. I did get one comment card, Sam. Um, you may come up to make a comment for uh, three minutes. And if anybody else wants to make a public comment, again, we have uh, the green comment cards up here at this desk and you can just turn them right into me. Sam, you may go ahead uh, for three minutes. Please state your name and your affiliation. Yes, um, my name is Samuel Vasquez, and I'm with the Clean Air Coalition. Um, I just wanted to start by uh, commending the Board of Environmental Safety for, um, you know, conducting uh, the appeal hearing yesterday. I know it was the first one for the agency, but I think that it was a breath of fresh air. It's a breath of fresh air to see that there is additional oversight and accountability after many, many, many years of concerns with the process and with, you know, frustrations at the bureaucracy. And uh, I believe it's very important that, you know, our community is able to participate. And I also appreciate you coming out to Hacienda Heights. Um, and I just wanted to share that, you know, there's this has been building up over many years. There's been a lot of frustration from our community from participating in, you know, the limited community engagement that has um, that has been conducted where we feel like nothing gets done. We're just running around in a circle and we see the same talking points from the same consultants and the same lobbyists. And they try to reassure us that everything's fine, but it's not. The reality here on the ground is that we believe that the facility of Ecobat Quimeco is a serial non-complier and that at night they're engaging in uh, operations activities that are not in compliance with the law. Yesterday, they discussed at length about the WESP and the millions of dollars they've invested to be the cleanest lead battery smelter in the world. And that is categorically not true. Um, but we're not, it puts added pressure on us to have to hold them accountable. And when we try to exercise that role, you know, such as when a video was released talking about potential contaminated water leaching into the San Jose Creek, which then goes into San Gabriel River and provides 80% of the drinking water for those of us that live in the San Gabriel Valley. When these questions are raised, and they're questions, right? Because nobody's saying that we know definitively that this is actually contaminated. We just believe that there is a high likelihood and prob probability of that and that we would like to see an investigation be carried out. When we, when the video is shared, I was CC'd um, a threatening letter from um, the lawyers representing Quimeco, um, essentially, insinu in, essentially insinuating that they're gonna sue me, right? Or that litigation is a possibility. And so it makes it difficult for us. I'm not paid to be here. I'm not paid to try to exercise the concerns of the community. I'm here because it affects us, because my sister is a cancer survivor. 
because she can never have children from here on out moving forward. And because we are deeply invested in this community. Yeah, that's time. Thank you. And thank you for being here yesterday as well. Thank you. So that was the only in-person comment card that I received. I will now uh, go to Zoom and ask that for participants on Zoom who would like to make a public comment, please raise your virtual hand. If you're having technical difficulties or are unable to make a verbal comment, please have your uh, comment um, typed into the Q&A chat function and type, uh, please read aloud and we will read those aloud. I will go to the first um, the, first, the first hand raised on Zoom, Jen Ramata. Please accept the invitation to unmute. You have three minutes. Please state your name and affiliation. Sure. Hi. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jennifer Ganada. I am a senior staff attorney at Communities for a Better Environment. Um, I, this is for just general public comment, correct? Yes. Yes, for items not oh. on the agenda. Okay, great. Um, I just actually wanted to follow up on, on I think, what one of the last speakers um, before we had gone for break had mentioned, um, just regarding CEQA and streamlining processes. Um, I don't, you know, I actually, I'm not sure, uh, like, what influence the Board of Environmental Safety might have over this, but I do think that there is many large loopholes right now, um, given that we do have a housing crisis. However, there are many of the sites that they're trying to, um, the developers are really targeting are ending up in a lot of the communities that have been overburdened by pollution um, for many decades. And I just wanted to like mention specifically, I know that DTSC had made a comment to the city of Bell regarding a mitigate, mitigated neg deck for a project out um, by Salvation Army. And I, I think it, like my concern there is that I think it's important to have permanent supportive housing, but if you are having housing that is going to be housing some of the most vulnerable communities and on toxic sites that it needs to be cleaned up properly, but there really isn't any further oversight that I think DTSC can even push the pro project proponent. So I think this inconsistency or this loophole needs to be dealt with in some way because for that track, for that project, um, I mean, I think it's going to go forward in a way without, unless I think the state has some sort of say how we do projects and development on previously contaminated sites. So I just wanted to kind of support what the last speaker before the break had said. I, I think that this is something that does need to be looked at a little bit more because um, we are doing these projects currently and we're doing them as soon as we can but i think in order to minimize harm and to ensure public safety we really do need to make sure that there is some type of environmental review and that we're preserving sequa um so thank you thank you for your comment i know it was also heard by dtsc they're here they're present so thank you for that Thank you. Moving on to the next hand raise, we have a total of three. Again, if you want to make a public comment for items not on the agenda on Zoom, please raise your virtual hand. The next person I see is D.H. McKee. Please accept the request to unmute. Please state your name and your affiliation. You have three minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, I know you got, this is Duncan McKee. I was there yesterday. I know you got quite an earful on Quimetco, but we were limited to uh, items that pertain to the hearing and the equipment. So I just wanted to make sure that we didn't lose sight of the fact that there are permit conditions from the 2005 permit that have yet to be met. And we want to be sure that those aren't just removed from the permit that they say they're going to release around the first of the year. That they should be required to actually meet those permit conditions. That permit was issued on the pretense that it would help bring them into better compliance. And, and we want to make sure those conditions don't just go away. And we're hoping there's even more conditions that are added on that will help improve the situation over there. There's soil, groundwater, surface water contamination, there's air emissions coming from stacks that are not routed to the 
wet electrostatic precipitator or the thermal oxidizer that are these big supposed state-of-the-art pieces of equipment that on one occasion at least blew up and caught on fire. And also I get emails that they're breaking down on a regular basis and they claim there's no emissions, no harmful emissions, but yet there aren't any, isn't any testing at the times they break down to, to uh, verify that. Um, the last couple of weeks, there's been cranes over there installing what appear to be their new furnaces or new kettles. And when I asked uh, the DTSC folks about that yesterday, they didn't seem to know anything about that. So we're wondering, and my question and hope for the board is to help to facilitate better communication between the various regulatory agencies that are charged with not only regulating them, but protecting the public health and safety. And South Coast Air Quality Management District is one of the key players here. And they did not contact DTSC and make them aware of the application to start acting as an incinerator and incinerating hazardous waste, which they're not permitted to do. And it'd be an actual illegal or criminal activity from what I understand. Um, and, you know, I got a report of burning plastic uh, odors this morning. And I, uh, from a reliable business owner in the area who actually did report it to AQMD. So we're hoping that okay. somehow we could get better communication between the regulatory agencies and, and everybody be on the same page. And that would include Fine. members of the frontline community that are aware of some of these things that are going on that. Thank you, Duncan. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I, I didn't realize I'd run over my time, but thank you very much for the opportunity to, to uh, communicate with the board and we appreciate everything that you're doing. Thank you. Um, was, did everyone who needs to hear that understand it well enough or do I need to ask him to send an email? We're good. Okay. DTSC has it. Thank you. Okay, moving on to the next person on Zoom. The next hand raise is Jenny Knack. Please, oh, you already stated your name and affiliation before. You have three minutes. Thank you. DTSC held a public Zoom on November 9th concerning the SSFL Area 1 burn pit remediation to be conducted under a imminent and substantial endangerment action. Community members were eager to attend, yet there were several aspects of the meeting and the content provided that we're lacking. I'm unsure as to whether the meeting's posted on the DTSC website, but as this meeting wasn't covered in Dr. Williams' update today, as far as I heard, I hope that if it is able to be viewed by the board, that you review it, including the chat dialogue if possible. The Area 1 burn pit is one of the most extensively contaminated areas of the site, location of many years of illegal and reckless dumping and combustion of hazardous waste. In a strategy to save on money, to save money on responsible health protective hazardous waste disposal. Yet the emergency cleanup area action of this area is permitted to evade all CEQA regulatory guidelines because of the emergency action designation. So no public input was allowed before the cleanup decisions for the burn pit were made. Public input procedures during the Zoom meeting did not allow all participants to participate that had raised their hands, but others were allowed to participate multiple times. I get that sometimes people make mistakes, but um, many, if not most of the questions that were not sufficiently answered and or clearly communicated, resulting in little increased understanding on the part of the attendees. The calls for independent confirmation sampling post remediation were denied and concerns repeatedly expressed surrounding independent sampling specifically to be conducted completely independent of Boeing, the responsible party in this area, were minimized and openly dismissed by DTSC. Our main concerns about the Area 1 burn pit were not addressed, especially those that discuss the incredibly weak cleanup standards for this action, even from an ecological perspective, as noted by an independent wildlife biologist on the Zoom. As no public health risks were taken into account in deciding the remediation plans for this action, Again, the burn pit's one of the most extensively contaminated portions of the site. 15 seconds. Uh, well, I'm, I would ask if it's permissible to submit our written comments 
on the burn pit action to the board um, and please advise on how to engage further on this issue. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, every, anyone who was not able to participate today can always email us at besinfo at bes.dtsc.ca.gov. If I can have uh, one of my colleagues, please post that into the chat. And I will go on to the last hand raised on Zoom. And then I will go on to Spanish comments. Um, Adriana Quinones, can you please accept the request to unmute? You have three minutes. Please state your name and affiliation. Good afternoon. My name is Adriana Quinones, community advocate and also member of the Clean Air Coalition. First of all, I want to say thank you to the board for being so open about finally hearing our community. It's been nine long years, and we finally feel that we are being heard. So thank you for that. You have brought some confidence back into us having confidence in our government. So I appreciate each one of you. I wanted to bring to your attention that the community engagement, community outreach needs to change. Some communities like ours, you know, Sienda Heights, Avocado Heights, La Puente, and North Whittier have uh, Spanish speaking. We have Chinese speaking, Korean speaking, and the outreach has not been there. Um, I will offer to work with DTSC in going to the churches, going to the schools, going to community meetings so that our community is aware um, there's many, many people that are still not aware of the uh, possible contaminants uh, that are uh, that we are being exposed to. Um, I also wanted to bring to your attention that we need to change the way DTSC settles with companies, uh, especially with Cameco, 29 violations, and they get a slap on the hand. I think that needs to change to include the community because after all, we are the ones that are being affected. Many of our loved ones are dying and many people are being affected with health issues. So, uh, you know, I also wanted to bring to your attention that SQMD, DTSC, the Water Board and other agencies need to have regular community meetings so that all of them are on the same page and we don't need to go in circles trying to explain to them what you know what we how we are being affected so i think these three recommendations will do wonders and will bring back uh public confidence um now we have confidence in you the board but we're still not we still don't have confidence in dtsc sqmd and other agencies but this is the beginning i thank you so much and you have a wonderful day Uh, thank you, and thank you for also being here yesterday. We appreciate your uh, feedback. Thank you. Thank you so much. So that was the last hand raised on Zoom. I'm going to check if there are any Spanish comments with the interpreters. But in the meantime, going to have um, staff confirm if we have any Q&A comments to read. I don't see any. No comments in the Q&A. Checking with interpreters if we have any Spanish comments. And Evelyn, we do have one more hand raised in the chat. Oh, I, I believe that was Adriana that just spoke. Oh, you're right. Apologies. Okay, no, no Spanish comments from the interpreters. So I will now move on to some emails that we received. Let me open up the emails. So have we completed that segment? We, we've completed uh, the, the, the last segment for public comment is reading out the emails that we received um, before the start of the board meeting. So I will go ahead and read those now. I have actually Sam already, oh no, this is a different person. One, two, 
We have only two emails to read out. Okay. The first one is from Samuel Brown. It reads, after the public hearing last night while driving back to my residence, I want to share this video, which was attached to the email, where noticeable fugitive emissions um, are seen from Kometco um, as he was leaving the beach house. Repeated efforts have been made to point out to DTSC that this is a daily occurrence, especially at night. What is the point of Kometco spending millions of dollars on the WESP emission stack if they repeatedly flout the regulations in place and avoid routing all emissions through the filter that is supposedly designed to keep us safe. I share this video to show that even on the night of a public hearing, when public scrutiny should be even more significant, you can see that Cometco simply can't, doesn't care about the public health of our community in Hacienda Heights, La Puente, Bassett, and Avocado Heights. Sam. The next one is from Don Moss. It reads, Madam Chair and Honorable Members of the Board, regarding the Board's action concerning the ECOBAT appeal hearing on 11-29-23, a procedural mistake was made by the Board wherein the issue at hand was not decided according to the regulations in place at the time of the appeal submission. Rather, the Board implemented its own notion of what should have occurred prior to the appeal filing and made its finding on the appeal based on that hypothetical notion. Due to this action, which was not supported by existing regulations, the BES has sent a message to DTSC that rules are not to be followed. This is problematic. The board is now the judicial body overseeing the entire purview of DTSC. As such, the board must lead by example and carefully follow the law. The appropriate manner to have ruled on the subject appeal would have been to closely rely on the intent of the regulations in place at the time of appeal and when those regulations are lacking in the eyes of the board, include in the administrative record to the board's observation of those limitations and its intent to appeal changes for future actions. Then at the next board meeting, a discussion item regarding the limitations of the current regulations and proposed solutions for those limitations should be discussed. As a result of that discussion, the various options to correct those limitations might include an immediate request from the governor's office to issue an emergency order for implementation while the legislative process plods through a formal re regulation change. Notwithstanding the fact that the above process was not, was not followed, an immediate action of this board meeting is indicated to start the process to adjust the community notification processes to conform to those the board considers most appropriate. Such an action on the part of the board today is necessary to correct the confusing message sent to DTSC. Thank you for your immediate action on this issue. Don C. Moss, Avocado Heights Community Advocate, and she lists, or they list their uh, phone number. Okay, so that concludes all of the emails that we received prior to this board meeting. I don't see any other Q&A. Uh, you know what, I will go back and ask if we have Jacob Paradise, um, either on Zoom or in person, they were one of the folks that signed up prior to this meeting online. I don't see them. I do have one more Q&A comment from Laura Rosenberger. Uh, Sheena, I don't see the entirety of this Q and A comment. Can you please read it out or just swap? Of course, I can, I can read it. I can read it. Can this is from um, Laura Rosenberger Hader. My comment: Your tough labor standards for cleanup workers would get a lot of employees sick, especially for productivity standards. Then they would drop contamination and spread it accidentally, and then also provided her contact info. That's it. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for those comments, and we'll. Um, We'll evaluate everything that we receive as we do and refer it appropriately. So thank you. That's the end of that segment. Okay, great. Um, we now have Diana Vasquez Ballesteros, who um, is the legislative director for DTSC, and she's going to give us a legislative update. Thank you. Yes, you well, yeah. Good afternoon. Thank you again, um, Chair and Board Members. So again, my name is Yana Vasquez Ballesteros. I'm the Deputy Director of Legislation Regulatory Review for the Department. So and definitely thank you for the flexibility this morning too, for being able to move around the agenda. 
with that, I do want to provide a legislative update and also acknowledge that this is our first legislative update for the board. So definitely excited. Um, and, you know, we really see it as more as a starter of the conversation and how we can actually um, continue the conversation um, on our legislative update. So before that, I will explain a little bit about the Office of Legislation and Regulatory Review within the department. So we're a small office within the department. Um, as you all know, we are a mid-sized department, about 1,400 um, staff members. Our office is um, about 10 individuals um, composed of scientists, um, also um, program analysts, legislative anal analysts, um, myself included, um, and also admin assistants. So we're a small but mighty office, and our really primary focus is working on, on being the point of contact for elected officials at the state federal level, also working with the state, um, California state legislature on legislative proposals. Um, as well, we also work with our different programs on regulatory adoption. So we also have the regulatory um, arm within the department. And with that, I'm gonna focus pr primarily on the legislative aspect of what we did this past year. So there was a lot of activity um, that we did and just for a little context. So it's um, with the legislature, at least in California, we have a two year session which means that we have two years to really accomplish kind of a legislative cycle where we can introduce bills or at least the legislature can introduce bills and then they can go through the process. And if they're not successful the first year, then they have a second year to be successful. So we just finished the first year of a two year session. So we're still in the middle of the session and we're gonna be starting the California um, state legislature is gonna be starting session at the beginning of next, um, what are we, November 30th, <laughs> so in January. Third, so we're going to be starting session and really continuing the conversations that we didn't finish um, this prior year. So, and with that, we can go into the second slide. There's a clicker there on oh. the podium for you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Am I clicking? It it may lag a couple seconds. Oh, okay. Somebody go help me. No. Oh, okay. We're good. Oh. And if not, I can just go through the. Oh. <laughs> okay. No. Okay. So at least, and then the slides are in the package too, and also online, so we can I can just go through the different slides too. So at least on the second slide, um, really one of the really core missions of how bills are assigned to the department is really based on jurisdiction. So it's the jurisdiction that the department has through authority that we already are granted. So any bills that directly or indirectly impact the department are assigned to our department for us to provide um, technical assistance, to be able to actually provide a little bit more background on if there's any um, specifically functions of how we can actually um, consider legislative proposals, if um, it's gonna impact any of our three core programs, specifically the site mitigation restoration program, hazardous waste management program, and the safer consumer products program. Um, within that, oh, yeah, thank you. Um, one of the things that we look at is really the obligations of how we look at these bills. So if there's any direct impact to the department, those bills are directly assigned to us. Um, and then from there, given that the board now has also jurisdiction over their jurisdictions, we will also work with you know, your staff and your, your obviously the board members on how those bills are going to be impacting the board. And that's a new function, obviously, with the creation of a board that we're also establishing. Um, this year, and you know, basically since reform that happened in July 1st of 2021, there has been really more of an uptake of how many bills have been introducing, um, introduced by the legislature on how it really impacts our programs. And we have seen this increase of bills since you know 2021, where you know, with the DTSC and governor's fee reform, that was a huge overhaul of the, the department. Um, and we saw a couple bills introduced in 2021 and also 2022, but we really saw more bills introduced of really directly impacting our programs this year. And if we go into the next slide, I think, okay, perfect, it works. So we had about 23 or so bills that were assigned to our department. 
specifically out of those 23, um, 10 were actually sent to the governor for his consideration. So out of those 10, six were actually signed into law, four were vetoed, and 13 are two-year bills. Like I mentioned, we're in a two-year cycle. So we're still going to be continuing those discussions moving forward for the next year. With that, um, out of the bills that were actually signed into law specifically, the bulk of them were um, impacting the hazardous waste management program. So specifically for them, um, you can see that's something that um, we work with their staff to really make sure that the impacts were actually going to be um, meaningful and intentional um, based on the intent of the bills. Um, and then you can see followed by both side mitigation restoration program and the safer um, consumer products program. And we'll go into a little bit of what those bills are. Perfect. Um, and then this slide, you can see out of the bills that were signed into law, I really want to kind of go through a little bit, explaining two of them. You know, I'm, we can stay here for an hour explaining all of them. But one of the things I do want to highlight is that every year we have, as a department, we have a legislative mandate report that we put together, specifically our office puts together for our department staff, but also for the public to really understand what are the bills impacts and how are they impacting the program. So within our legislative mandate report, and I can share the link um, at, the, at the end of this presentation, um, it also shows if the bills either expanded specific requirements for the programs or actually um, decreased uh, specific requirements or authorities for each program. So it's a really good guide of really understanding some of these impacts with the some of the bills that we have been working on. And you can actually see previous reports from the past legislative years, so you can kind of see how the report is, is um, outlined and then really it's really helping more our program staff of how to really see the new functions of, of really what they need to actually start um, following. So with that, I'm gonna be um, addressing at least two bills, specific bills um, that we worked on with different stakeholders, specifically um, with uh, Senator Office. I wanna definitely highlight SB uh, 642 by Senator Cortese. It's the bill that authorizes county council at the request of the certified unified program agencies, COOPA for short, and DTSC to bring civil actions to enforce the violations of hazardous waste um, control laws, which basically means is another way for us to actually work with our county councils to bring suit for any violation. So it really brings a little bit more um, uh, enforcement authority where we have our working with our 58 counties um, collectively to ensure that the hazardous waste control laws are followed at the local level. So it's really providing a little bit more of an oversight at the lo local level and really interactions of how we can work as a state. Um, another notable bill is AB 1403 by Garcia. Eduardo Garcia specifically, and it requires DTSC to provide consultation to state fire marshal to develop guidance and training to local agencies that seize, collect, transport, and store and treat um, seize fireworks. And this is huge because this is an ongoing issue as most of, you know, it's been ongoing for the last 10, 20 years where how do we work with our local fire departments when um, fireworks are seized? Because once they're seized, they're actually considered hazardous waste. And a lot of the local departments don't really know what to do with them. So this is us providing consultation and training services to a local fire department on how to actually treat them and collect them and dispose of them in a, in a safe manner. So those are two bills that we worked on closely with um, the different stakeholders, with the author's office. You can see that there's other bills we also worked on. Um, but also want to definitely highlight other bills that um, you know were actually vetoed by the governor. But we are in... in constant conversations with the different authors, but also the stakeholders. Out of the four bills that were vetoed, four of them were specifically dealing with PFAS and chemicals, or at least banding um, PFAS and chemical products. And we are actively having conversations with the author's office as we speak, also with the different stakeholders. And really one of the reasons why those bills were vetoed, they lacked regulatory oversight. Um, one of the things that we're really having conversations is if we are going to be banding products that have PFAS in the market, what would that look like? And then who is responsible for ensuring that the different um, manufacturers are in compliance? So we're in active conversations um, as we speak right now, really figuring out what an enforcement 
framework looks like, but also a compliance framework looks like for the manufacturers. Um, and another, and this is the exception is AB 407, which um, dealt with used oil. And this is used oil, not household um, hazardous waste used oil, but more manufacturing used oil. And that's the bill that um, we are actually also having, um, we're gonna be you know, kind of looking into our practices of how do we actually regulate used oil and what are better practices to actually look at this issue moving forward. And those are the four bills that um, were actually vetoed. But I do want to highlight the bills that are still two-year bills. We, you know, those are the bills that are still in consideration. Like I mentioned, out of the twenty-three that we are currently um, that we looked at this year, there's thirteen bills that are still active in the legislature, and some of them are going to be actually still in our jurisdiction, and some of them actually are going to be changed to different subject matter, so outside of our jurisdiction. So, you know, those are the things that we're still looking at until they actually get modified, which we call them amended, we're going to be tracking them. Um, and this is not even including the new bills that are going to be introduced. So that's another update that we're going to be providing at least to the board next year. Um, but one of the things, at least for us, you know, we're still having conversations, like I mentioned, regarding the PFAS and consumer products so with the different stakeholders. Um, and also assembly members and senator offices. This is gonna be a huge issue in the next year, I can say. Um, there's a lot of interest um, from all parties, the manufacturers, producers, the legislature, but also there's a lot of movement at the national international level regarding um, this subject matter. So I know this is not gonna be the last topic we're gonna be talking about PFAS. Um, and another issue that we're actually looking at is offshore legacy dumping of pesticides. Um, we are actively, again, having conversations with the different stakeholders, the author's office, but also committee consultants. Um, another issue that we're also looking at, and that you can see this through the hazardous waste management report, is the end of life of solar panels and AV batteries. This is huge because one of the things I think we heard about, um, you know, who's responsible is the consumer responsible, is a producer responsible. I think one of the things is having conversations of how do we actually dispose of these materials and look at the end of life, but also look at the, the you know, even the the upstream of the, the creation of the, of, of the product, sorry. <laughs> and um, so it's gonna be an active conversation at least we're having, um, again, with the different stakeholders. And really, I think right now is really looking at different models throughout the, the country and also, even the nation of how to properly dispose of these materials. Okay. And at least also one of the things I really want to thank, um, you know, just everybody that has worked on any bill analysis or even um, final enrolled bill reports, which we call them EBRs for short. Um, regardless if the bills have not been presented to the governor, it still requires 100% of staff time. There's about 50 or so staff throughout the department that actually actively engage with our office. Like I said, we are 10 um, of individuals. This is not just done you know, in silos. We work closely with our core programs. Um, They're obviously made up of scientists, engineers, and technical staff. We also work with our supported programs, legal, budget, um, you know, outreach engagement staff to really figure out what are the different components that we're missing? And that's one of the things I did definitely want to give credit to everybody who has been actively involved um, in a lot of bills that even don't even make it into a bill analysis, but we still work on providing technical assistance. So it's a lot of um, uh, silent work, we call it, you know, and it's thankless work. But I think one of the things I really want to acknowledge is that there's a lot of individuals that um, put a lot of hours and then, you know, hours during the weekends um, because the legislature, you know, we follow the legislature's calendar and and sometimes they don't, you know, they don't take weekends off. So definitely want to acknowledge that. And that's something that I, you know, I am thankful for my staff and definitely thankful for um, everybody who's involved in the process of actually developing um, our analysis. And with that, I will say one of the things that we want to do, um, at least moving forward, is really partner up with the legislature. Um, we're having a lot of really good conversations with the legislature, especially with a lot of new members who are um, you know, first year senators and assembly members who really wanna engage with our department, including the board. And that's one of the things I can see the difference coming in the next couple of years where we're gonna be actively and proactively engaging with the legislature on really thinking about ways to really address some of these issues. 
um, because a lot of it also requires changing authority and also changing our our existing or even giving us additional authority, even modifying some authorities that we have to actually better serve the communities that we um, are representing. And with that, we also want to say we want to um, also thank a lot of the stakeholders, both um, environmental, environmental justice, and also uh, industry stakeholders who have been actively engaging with our office, with our programs, and really thinking about proposals before they're even introduced. And that's something that we really want to be really thankful for the stakeholders that they're actually coming to us before any bills are in print. And that really is helpful just because anybody who works in, in this type of um, schedule is really hard to be thoughtful when you have deadlines you have to meet. But if we can actually have the time and, 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 um, and attention during the interim to actually think about some of these really difficult, complex issues, it really helps everybody involved. And more than anything, it helps us to be able to bring our experts um, without really impacting their current work. Um, just really want to emphasize that. So. Um, and with that, I want to just um, end with a little bit more, you know, information. You know, we do have a website, at least for the Office of Legislation for Electoral Review. Um, like I mentioned, our legislative year mandate report is going to be coming out at the beginning of next year, um, sometime in January. So we're going to be sharing that uh, with the board, but also with the public. And then that's where you can actually see a little bit more in depth of all the bills that were signed and vetoed. And I think with that, uh, any questions? Thank you, Deanna. Um... That was a great summary. I, I having for any of us who've worked on legislation, we know so much of it doesn't ever come up into the public view. Mm -hmm. Right? You're down there on the ground in the weeds. Work you can work a hundred hours on something that never turns into a bill. <laughs> and despite the how a bill becomes a law video, not all of them make it through that video, right? Mm -hmm. So I I definitely appreciate all that you do. Um and the idea, the forward thinking about mm -hmm. new legislators and engaging them early on, um, we're happy to participate in briefings, mm -hmm. um, whatever, whatever we can do to mm -hmm. support advancing the orientation of the new staff, because we already know from feedback or interactions we've had, people don't know everything that you do, and they definitely don't know everything that we do. So mm -hmm. um, however we can be supportive in that, I just want to uh, say you've been a tr tremendous asset for us. Stakeholders who might want to contact you, that's the email, right? DTSC Legislative Office, because you talked about how sometimes you get information from stakeholders that help you get engaged early. What's the best way for them to reach you? So definitely using the email, um, and it's, you know, at least our office monitors this email at least every 48 hours. So, you know, just you're not going to get a response in 24 hours, but at least no. we will be responsive. And especially if there's any proposals, we would like to know if there's any current proposals in the legislature that um, either, you know, folks have issues, they want to actually have, you know, provide a little bit more information from us, we can provide that. That's helpful for us to really figure out how to really provide um, more of a recommendation. And what we do as a department is we recommend um, to the governor, um, you know, our recommendation as a department. And that's one of the things is really huge that we take in and put from all the stakeholders. So what we hear and we provide that recommendation to the governor for his consideration. And I think that's really important for everyone to hear board and our, you know, the hundred or so people that may still be on our Zoom to know what you're looking out for and mm -hmm. how you're advancing. Uh, because whatever legislation is in place is what we have to work with. And if there's mm -hmm. something that is not what we need or there's something new that we do need, it's really good to to get that uh, input and feedback. And, and so I just wanna appreciate that and see if other board or staff have any questions or comments for uh, Deanna. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I want to say that I really appreciate you and all that you've done to help prepare us for our ledge hearing. I just want to <laughs> say for for those of you that don't know, um, getting ready to go before uh, the legislature, um, as um, Meredith and I had to do in August, and 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 even in places where we're having individual meets, uh, having access to you and your team for prep 
has been immensely useful. So um, yeah, you're not no. going away, right? <laughs> we're not, we're not no, letting no. you go anywhere, no, no. Um, but thank you. And for those who also don't know, I want to tout your involvement in the early days at, before your government mm -hmm. service in the reform that created the board. So you are often for us deep knowledge on the history, on the, on the people who are engaged in it. You've provided us with amazing resources on that. Oh, you should read this, or you should take a look at that, or be sure you look at the, you know, the um, report that the communities did that helped create it. These are things that we wouldn't know on our own, and it's been immensely helpful. So I really wanna go on record as having thank you for that, because it, it's been part of our onboarding Mm -hmm. The People Senate, for example, you know, there are a number of, of documents like that that were incredibly useful. And if any of our team ha haven't schooled themselves on that, shame on me for not reminding you. But um, that's a core. There are documents like that that uh, really help us understand how we wound up here. We didn't get here just out of nowhere. There was a tremendous amount of effort that had to go into years of of work and legislative work. And while nothing is ever exactly the way you probably thought about it and designed it to begin with, um, I would say you gave us enough work, okay? Mm -hmm. So so even though there are people that would like to see more mandates for us, thank you right now. I think we've, we've got a full plate, but you were very instrumental in making that happen. I wanna take this opportunity publicly to thank you. Yeah, no. <laughs> Well, I never get the chance to yeah, do that. I know. was not expecting that, but it's, it's definitely a collective effort. I'm, you know, it's obviously I'm not here standing by myself. I think there's a lot of individuals that we can be here thanking, but this is why it's important having written record um, of support letters of, you know, opposition letters or neutral letters. I think having written record of being able to pass on the knowledge. And I think our office is trying to really collect that and, and be able to archive that for anybody who, is here 10, 20 years from now, who okay. can actually figure out the list of intent. Right. From that. So appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we will have our fabulous closing. I don't know how you agreed to do this, Madam Vice Chair, but at the end, Alexis is the best note taker in the world. You can't have her. Don't ask her to take notes for you, but she is our note taker and our action item. A recorder. So thank you for telling us all what the action items are from this meeting. We have 10 action items and um, I invite my board members and staff colleagues. If there's something that um, I've missed, please um, let me know. You can send me a note and I will work with Swathi to um, finalize these. The first one came from Swathi's executive officer report in which she mentioned that we will be launching our ombuds website in the next few weeks. Secondly, in the hazardous waste permit appeal update that we provided, um, there was a question in the public comment about whether it's possible to estimate the revenue that would result from avoided penalties or fines. I think that is probably pretty difficult to do, but I will take it in um, as an action item for us to discuss and confer with DTSC and find the appropriate way to respond. Thirdly, the DTSC leadership report from Director Williams, she and our Exide team that focused on the contracting process, Georgette and Sushma, are going to schedule a debrief um, working with Todd. Next, um, we as a board are going to try to plot out what some of the major milestones in next year's calendar look like in terms of deliverables, Obviously, we know when our board meetings are going to be, um, and we are going to discuss that in our regular meetings with Meredith. There are a number of things that we just need to chart out over the course of the year. And then um, our, our staff attorney, Greg Forrest, is going to give us regular updates on how the DEIB effort um, at um, the council that he participates in how that is working and how we as a board um, can integrate ourselves into this effort in one way or another. In the board member reports under the EJAC, I have that DTSC 
is going to be finalizing the framework and the other related um, EJAC elements to put that together. For CVCI, um, Georgette noted that there will be a future proposal on the evaluation process and best practices with the idea of influencing as well the third round of funding um, and leading also into our six month from now BES report to the legislature on CDCI. Uh, with regard to the facility FiberTech, um, Katie Butler will clarify the BSP score issue and um, we will anticipate the potential of a permit decision for that facility in March of 2024. We as a board approved our board meeting minutes for July and September. We adopted those minutes. And lastly, under the hazardous waste management plan, um, the board members, five categories of recommendations will be put together as a document and forwarded to our DTSC colleagues. Um, and ideally would also have a place on either our January or March board meeting agenda. Do you have any other changes or additions? I just wanted to clarify and correct me if I'm wrong for the, um, this is Evelyn, uh, for the VSP score, the violating score, scoring procedure um, regarding PTI, I believe we needed to get back, uh, the board needed to um, ask a specific question of Katie for her to respond um, on the clarification for the VSP. No, I, I said it as the violation scoring procedure for the fiber tech facility. There's one organization in DTSC that establishes that score. And um, Ms. Butler will be confirming that information with the attorney for fiber tech and, and letting us know so that we can properly represent it. Got it. Understood. Thank you. With that, um, Madam Chair, those are the action items. I will um, prepare those and send them on to our executive officer. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Alexis. Any closing comments from board members on, um, you're still awake? Uh, how are we, uh, right. anything, or staff? Linda, I hope you are feeling great at the end of these two days. I just want to, I don't know that Linda got enough acknowledgement. Uh, and I'm going to just do it again. You're just going to have to live with it. Um, Linda Ocampo, our engineer, worked feverishly and tirelessly on the uh, on the whole permit appeals. And I want to remind everybody that we do have an emergency reg authority and you worked on on helping us get those in place and executing them with with Greg and with Swafi. But I want to acknowledge um, how you briefed all of us over and over again um, in the 221 configuration. Uh, and that's not easy, right? And then we each one of us might have something and you come back with changes. So I, I really do want to acknowledge that. And Sheena, who's remote, we thank you for always being there, hovering over us, <clears throat> even though you couldn't join us this time. And Evelyn, for your first time as board yeah. clerk, um, thank you. You got you got thrown into it at the last minute and you were just grace and charm through the whole thing. Um, Swathi. I don't know what to say. We've got the best executive officer that, that ever came down. And those folks in the back of the room never, it, you know, forget. They really had challenges. And <clears throat> this is not the easiest facility to do a hybrid meeting in. But we're committed to it. Um, that's the model of the board meetings and board hearings. And I want to thank the facility, I, you're back there, put your hand up. Um, the sound guy with his hand on the game the entire time, right? Trying to get the sound up. So I thank you for that. And of course, my colleagues, board members, we, I just, I, I don't know, it's maybe an emotional moment, but you know, we were all appointed by different people. Um, we came together, not having chosen each other, but being chosen to be with each other. And it has been an amazing opportunity and the generation of friendship and caring and collegiality. So I want to thank you all for being our board. And I'm going to stop now. Thank you. Do I have a motion to adjourn? 
Oh, closing comments. Go ahead. Yes, please do. With that, I, I really want to uh, thank my board colleagues uh, for uh, for this this space for uh, for really um, you know with the limitations that we have with Bagley Keen, um, we somehow manage, <laughs> and I feel like we have gotten a lot done, and um, and and I really do value this opportunity to to serve on this board because it it really does. Um, allow me to represent um, environmental justice community and um, specifically, you know, my my neighborhood of South East LA. Um, as somebody who grew up in an environmental justice frontline community, it's very important to have somebody like me um, have this ability to um, make a difference and it's meant the world to me. And um, and I'm I'm hopeful that I can continue. Um, I, I am up for reappointment under the new speaker. So um, crossing my fingers that I can come back at the next board meeting. Thank you. Which one? We really want you reappointed. I just want to say that publicly. Uh, when new speakers come in, um, it's not uncommon for them to look at their appointments or new legis you know, legislators that have uh, sole independent authority. So we do have a new uh, speaker of the assembly, and he's assessing all the appointments. And we we um, we want you back. So it's just that simple. We're putting it out in the universe. Okay. No. Swathi, no. Linda, Alexis. No, no. I think it's a wrap. Do I have a motion? Madam Chair, I move that we adjourn this meeting. Is there a second? I think all hands are up. Unanimous consent. Okay, Love. thank you all so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. The board is adjourned at 2.13 p.m.